We've received apologies from Gil Patterson and Alex Rowley and been advised that Richard Lyle is hoping to join us a little later this morning. I want to take this opportunity to bid farewell to Kate Forbes, who's been a member of the committee since it was established. Uh, I think on behalf of all of the members, I can say that I, uh, we thank her for her contribution to the work of the committee over the last two years and wish her well in her new committee roles. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four, five, six and seven in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda uh, is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's National Performance Framework National Outcomes. We are joined by Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Good morning. Professor Colin Moffat, Dr Linda Pooley, Sarah Granger and Roger Halliday, who will be assisting her. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to say anything or can we move straight to questions? Um, I just want to apologise for being a couple of minutes late, Convener. I just got to Parliament and realised I'd forgotten my pass. So <laughs> I'm sure everybody has been in that position. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and uh, uh, no, I don't have opening remarks, okay. so um, if you so want we'll, to go straight to we'll, questions. We'll, we'll move straight to, to questions. Uh, John Scott. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and your team. Um, First question is, uh, how did the Scottish Government determine what the communities in Scotland are in this? Um, I think there's a kind of fairly widespread and uh, throughout a variety of different pieces of legislation uh, understanding of the idea of community uh, in, in Scotland. Obviously for uh, for some purposes, there are particular definitions, and uh, in uh, uh, in other um, uh, uh, parts of what we do, um, there are rather broader uh, broader ideas. Um, I think from the from the point of uh, the national performance framework. Sorry? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering where, it, from the point of view of where, where it Because I have quite a lot of stuff here, as you can imagine. It's, no, it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 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 if, are you talking about the consultation aspect of this as to how we consulted? In terms of the, the performance and the key national indicators. Yes, it's uh, about consultation. It, it, it's about consultation mm -hmm. um, because I, 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 I mean, from a legislative perspective, obviously some pieces of legislation have very particular definitions of community or community organization or community representation and others, um, others have slightly different. Um, what we did in terms of actually consulting on this uh, um, was to uh, try and establish the widest representation possible um, from uh, uh, a range of sectors, a range of interests. Um, that would include policymakers as well as people like experts, uh, practitioners, academics, businesses, all were involved um, and we actually included the Children's Parliament as well to ensure that that that, that aspect of uh, of Scotland uh, was involved. There were about 200 external organisations invited to take part in this, so it's a very very wide range uh, of groups, um, and for obvious reasons, a significant significant number of those would have had a rural or and or environmental remit. Um, and there was a round table which also included COSLA and the STUC. So from the point of view of consulting communities, what we've done effectively is as wide a range as possible uh, that we could do, um, consonant with actually being able to deliver something practical. Thank you. Um, and so how were those representing their interests identified? I mean, are there key criteria for identifying 
um, stakeholders and, and communities. They're almost self-identified. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's, there's a wide range of, of sectoral interests, third sector interests, um, policy, you know, groups and all the rest of it that are almost self-identifying that you, you, you know, you would hardly not have included. Um, uh, as I said, the, there's around 220 uh, of, of these external organisations invited to take part. Um, so the identification uh, uh, would have been, um, I suspect, to try and include as many as possible uh, who would be able to, to contribute sensibly and quickly as well as effectively. So, um, uh, I, and I don't think, I, I might be wrong, and I'm just looking at officials now, I don't think it was a definitive list at the outset that we didn't depart from. I think it was a situation where there would be a wide range of organisations, individuals and groups consulted, but then if it became clear that there might be others required, then, then you would look to others too. So it wasn't a, it, it, it wasn't a set list that we were working from. It was, a, it was almost like a, 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 a living list that changed as we went. I don't know if you wanted to say something very specific about that. Sure. I mean, I guess the starting point was uh, networks that colleagues from the Scottish Government uh, had uh, of, of expert stakeholders, but we also have, uh, as Ms Cunningham said, uh, a round table uh, that advises on the um, advises on the national performance framework of which uh, Claudia Beamish is a, a member, but that's got experts uh, or kind of leaders from the public, private, and third sector, and we use the networks that that they had uh, in order to uh, try and get as wide a, a reach as as possible. So that uh, in the consultation that we worked with uh, Oxfam Scotland and the Carnegie UK Trust to um, go out in particular to, to communities across Scotland. And so criteria was to make sure that we had coverage in each part of Scotland, each of the sort of eight elect electoral regions, uh, certainly, and to, uh, in particular, with, in the community engagement that we did, to, uh, to go to places where people were already meeting. So uh, social clubs, sports clubs, uh, and other... Um, existing environments. And Oxfam Scotland, on top of that, uh, did a set of street stalls where they, again, uh, looked across Scotland and the, in, in thinking about this, they looked at um, making sure that we'd got a, a mix from the most deprived parts of Scotland to the most affluent parts of Scotland uh, so that we tried to build up as coherent a picture as possible. Would it be fair to say, then, it's, it's, it's ad hoc rather than formulaic, the process? Um, um, well, to, some, to some extent, it's, it's ad hoc, but I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it wasn't opportunist. A I think it wasn't like a prescribed a list, I think, is what we're saying. It, uh -huh. wasn't a, uh -huh. it wasn't a prescribed list that we set out with that list to do that consultation. Mm -hmm. um, there would be some very obvious uh, uh, people that you would speak to, and as the process goes through, then it could well draw in others. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there were a variety of different ways of doing things as well, because at one point there was an online survey um, uh, uh, as well as various kinds of conversations. So, so the, the, the way of doing it was, I, I guess ad hoc makes it sound like you were just making it up as you go along. It wasn't that either. <laughs> so it wasn't a prescribed list, but we did pull in other people yeah. as, so we, as the process went on. And so we've identified that there's around 220 bodies all thereby. So to what extent has the government responded to stakeholders' views on the outcomes and the indicators? Um, just do you go back to these people, they, having given them, them having given you their advice? Do you respond? Well, I think it would be a, there, there would be a continuing conversation that, that, that was around this. So it wasn't them formally giving a piece of advice, us taking the advice away and using that piece of advice to inform what we were doing. There would have been a, a more dynamic kind of process involved in a lot of that conversation. Yes. Sorry? It's an ongoing interactive process. Oops, sort of. That would two, be effective. Two particular stages. So the first stage we uh, asked, as, as I laid out the, the group of people, um, about the kind of Scotland that they want to live in. 
um, and what was important to them in their lives. And that helped us shape what the, the proposal that you've seen before in terms of 11 new national outcomes. Uh, there was a second phase uh, which was looking at the indicators that sit behind those outcomes. And in doing so, we, we, we engaged with a similar group of, um, of expert stakeholders and played back, I guess, the, the outcomes that, that, we'd, um, that we'd come out with, um, drawing upon all those, all those views. And things were revised slightly as, as a result of those second uh, conversations about indicators. So, for example... Uh, that we, uh, following suggestion on the uh, environment indicate uh, the environment outcome, uh, added the words uh, to enhance our environment um, that was suggested by some stakeholders at the, that event. I, th I think it's also worth adding at this point um, that uh, there were um, previous Scotland-wide consultations which formed some of the um, uh, foundation for this. Um, dating from 2015 and 2016, when there were two national public consultation exercises, one around what a fairer, more equal Scotland would look like, and the other what a healthier Scotland would lo look like. And both of those exercises um, comprised very substantial public engagement. There were over 16,000 participants in public events, and more than 400,000 people reached online. Now, that, that formed a kind of basis for, for, for what we were doing. Um, and uh, um, also, my understanding is that some of our delivery partners, Carnegie UK Trust and Oxfam Scotland, also themselves did street stalls in communities. So th 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 there's a lot of very organic stuff going on throughout this whole process that feeds back, um, uh, not just in a very formal sense, but in some cases quite informally as well. I just naturally want to identify that it's a robust process. Yeah. And, no, and I understand I, that. And it, I mean, the more I look at the notes, the more I see what's going on. <laughs> I'm um, pleased to see you're reading them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I haven't got this off and, my heart, and so I'm there afraid. Will be lots of, there will be lots of aspirations at the round table events. And uh, were, uh, how many of these, in a ballpark sense, were found to be feasible, measurable and affordable? Or... You know, were thirty percent of the ideas, uh, or fifty percent, or hundred percent? That would definitely be one. Have to, to take that. So, I suppose, w with the indicators, that w I mean, I suppose, we started uh, actually before this this review. It's important to mention that in twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen, we uh, twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen, we did a review of the. Uh, environment and rural indicators that were in the national performance framework, uh, working with uh, Environment Link, who are one of the partners here, and we introduced uh, indicators on uh, green space and on the National uh, uh, cap uh, Natural Capital Assets Index. Um, but then, uh, with the we did 22 workshops with 250 stakeholders as part of the uh, looking at the indicators uh, on our. Uh, national performance framework last year and that generated about 150 ideas of, of which uh, we've, we were currently measuring 66 um, indicators. Well, looking around uh, internationally we uh, saw that other systems uh, who tried to do a similar thing to us measuring environmental, social and, um, and economic measures had uh, 50 or less uh, indicators. So we had to try and turn that from 150 into 50. So the first stage, which you're asking about, is the feasibility of those indicators. Uh, and so I would say that the, the majority of things that were suggested uh, were, were feasible, uh, but some of those attracted a, a, a cost to collection, and that was part of the criteria for, for thinking about uh, which indicators to bring in. And I'll just finish off by saying that the other criteria that uh, I had to, to think through in, the, in doing that were uh, whether the measures were a decent, robust measure, so that whether they were based on good data, whether an increase or decrease meant an improvement or a worsening, so uh, w uh, whether they helped to, to measure our, uh, each of the 11 outcomes and whether they worked together or whether they were actually measuring similar things 
uh, and so we wanted to, to make sure that we had as, uh, as wide a, uh, a, a set of measures measuring different things uh, as possible. Thanks very much. Very briefly, Stuart Stevenson. Roger Halliday, just uh, do you think the final list covers every policy area for which the government is responsible? Uh, it's not necessarily meant to to be that. I mean, we're, as, of, as my role as the chief statistician, I'm aware that we've got 79 indicators here, but we've got we publish an awful lot more statistics, uh, and that. I was just being very specific. I understand, of course, there's a lot of detail underneath that. I'm just simply seeming to see, and I think you're suggesting there are policy areas not included, not covered by this. We, could you identify what they are then for us? Well, that's, you know, that, that's clearly not a straightforward question. Um, but uh, the, I, mean, I guess the, that um, overall what we've, um, we've worked to is having the outcomes uh, for Scotland that mean... Um, that, that are meaningful to people and uh, align with the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, align with Scottish Government policy, uh, and uh, help us to, to measure progress not just for, for Scotland but for, for communities in Scotland. Uh, and s therefore, say, the Scottish Government policies all feed up into to the outcomes, but the question is, uh, you know, the, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that necessarily the indicators uh, will measure, track progress on all government policies within the, Scot within the national performance framework, but we collect a much wider set of data and evidence in order to be able to do that. Uh, can I ask about uh, a sustainable economy and about the definitions that we have on this? So does a, a sustainable economy refer to economic growth that can continue indefinitely or to an economy that's in line with sustainable development and how do these differ? Um, I think from the government's perspective, um, we, we regard them uh, as consistent um, uh, with each other. Um, obviously our outcome is to have an inclusive and sustainable economy, so that's in the overall purpose statement, um, but it's not the only element. Um, effectively, what we're trying to do is balance economic, environmental, and social progress and keep the three of those um, in, in that balance. Um, it is the case that the government believes that economic growth is still an important driver for both Scotland's ability overall to flourish um, and for making sure that opportunities are available. But that growth can really only be via inclusive and sustainable kind of measures. So uh, I, I guess it's the, the, what lies underneath people's assumptions when they hear the phraseologies, um, uh, the, the, the notion that economic growth at any cost whatever is not one that the Scottish government adheres to. So when we talk about economic growth or sustainable economic growth, we are, you know, we have underlying that, the understanding that things have to be kept in balance. That's that, you know, to ensure um, that we get the best possible uh, outcomes um, for, for Scots as a whole. So we don't, from our perspective, we don't see the two things as being somehow inconsistent. C can I use the example of salmon farming? Um, do, do you see that as being consistent, the, the target to double production by 2030 as being consistent with sustainable development? I mean, you, you acknowledge that there are tensions between the economic and the environmental and the social. Do you think that's a target which is primarily driven by indefinite economic growth, or is there a sustainable development aspect to that target? sustainable development aspect to that target, that will be um, uh, achieved um, uh, in, in a way that ensures that we don't either get environmental or indeed, remember, for aquaculture, there's a kind of social uh, uh, and economic aspect as well. But the point is about keeping all of those in balance. Um, and no government is going to pick any industrial se sector and say that it can run out of control. So all sectors are subject to that same 
test that application that, uh, uh, that we're looking at balance uh, across the board to make sure that the growth is sustainable. It wouldn't do aquaculture any good if the growth was unsustainable because it would just end up leading to collapse. And that's the case in almost any <coughs> sector of our economy. It's a growth then with the aquaculture sector. Well, you would probably need to have that conversation directly with those people who are involved in the aquaculture sector. I should imagine, well, I, with, you know, with respect, I should imagine that for any country in the world that has an aquaculture sector, they may feel that there is a point beyond which it becomes difficult to sustain the growth, but it's about the sustainability of that growth. And I can't foresee what that sustainability might look like in the future because the, 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 the technologies around all of these things and the understanding and the science changes all the time. So what might look sustainable now may not look sustainable in five years' time, and vice versa. Um, so all we can ever do at any one point in regard to any sector in our economy is to make our best estimate <coughs> at present on the basis of what our current understanding is. Mm -hmm. um, is sustainable economic growth the only way to achieve a, a flourishing Scotland? I mean, do we need to be focusing more on well-being and do we have the appropriate basis to make judgments on our progress through well-being? Well, I, I mean, from my perspective, well-being would be so bound up with people's economic and, and social lives that I, I don't think you can just split the two off as if they were separate. Um, you know, we know, for example, that having, um, and I, I know this from a previous um, portfolio responsibility, that being involved in good and productive work is an enormous part of people's well-being. So economic growth is absolutely fundamental to people's well-being. So I, again, I, I don't see a sense in which you, 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 you can pit the two against each other. Uh, I, I think that would be a false way to look at the way uh, um, Scotland, or indeed any country, uh, works. Um, so, you know, defining uh, well-being as if it was somehow separate from economic growth or, you know, uh, uh, how we work in terms of uh, uh, the, the economic aspect of our, our culture is, is not helpful. Mm. I mean, there are, there are things around well-being that we can measure, but, you know, I've just indicated one that I know from a previous portfolio responsibility, which is that good productive work is something which is absolutely fundamental to people's well-being access to that work is fundamental to people's well-being so you know you know that's an indicator that would come out the economic growth side but would be fundamental to the well-being side so i don't think it's so easy to so are there pick indicators it apart. that the government's working on beyond gdp which is problematic because it counts all the bad things as well as all the good things well i i you know there may very well be interesting conversations going on elsewhere about how one measures, and I, I do know that there is a debate around whether or not GDP is the best way to measure uh, um, economic growth, um, that there may be other ways, uh, other ways to do it. I think the point I was trying to make is that you can't just separate out things in, in, in the way that we could say, well, there's the indicators for well-being, as if they don't somehow are also you know, impacted by, by the state of the economy. We know that they are say that that's exactly why we have a basket of indicators um, so that you can tell economic environmental and social progress uh, in Scotland and indeed we have got indicators uh, or we have we've had in the, um, the framework an indicator about mental well-being for, for quite some time and um, we've introduced uh, or proposing to introduce here uh, an indicator on child well-being and happiness uh, as well as uh, children's uh, physical and um, social development as well. Thank you. Um, that moves us on to a line of questioning. I wanted to pursue, um, inevitably when you go through a process like this, there are items, con things considered and dropped, um, things not included, and inevitably people take issue with where we've ended up. In terms of outcomes, we've gone down from 16 to 11. So can I ask for an understanding of the rationale behind why climate change, either in terms of adaptation or mitigation, aren't included in any in outcomes, and why research and innovation was removed from the outcomes, by way of example? Uh, well, I mean, obviously, th there's been a lot of 
a uh, lot of change backwards and forwards. Some things have expanded, others have, uh, have uh, not. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I think in fairness, I would need to say uh, that the outcomes that we've chosen do stem directly from that consultation process that we were talking about earlier, which is uh, an important thing to say uh, uh, as a kind of broader statement. Um, and uh, it is the, f the, the, the fact that outcomes don't fit into neat policy boundaries. So uh, some of the discussion around this kind of pulls in discussions around individual indicators as opposed to broader outcomes. Um, uh, uh, so um, whether or not something sits in the outcome list doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's not important, and there may be indicators that do relate to, uh, directly, um, uh, re directly to that. Um, I think our feeling about uh, uh, um, climate change is that there are, um, uh, there are important uh, uh, indicators already in relation to that, which is the greenhouse gas emission and carbon footprint ones. So we've already encompassed that in, in, in this framework. Um, and uh, the, the broader climate change outcome line fits into the sustainable development, sustainable economic growth part of the much broader outcome. I mean, it, it, the, the difficulty, I think, with an exercise like this is that you could end up just replicating everything at every stage throughout the entire process, and you would end up with a, a, a document which would be enormous and, and lose some of its, of its functionality. Okay. There are, I mean, you know, there are, there's an, an entire conversation to be had about which, what's in and what's not in, um, but I think the, the point that Roger made earlier about the numbers of indicators, for example, that we already have is at the top end uh, compared to most countries that do this sort of exercise. So they try to keep it around about 50 and we've ended up with about 79. So we're already pushing the boundaries on that. To indicators in a moment with Donald Cameron. Good question, Convener, about indicators. Okay, so I'll let you in in a minute then. Uh, then. Then turning to the indicators, Cabinet Secretary, um, as you say, we've gone from 55 to 79. Uh, it, however, there are no specific indicators for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, there was an indicator considered around growth and green economy, but it's not included. There's nothing on resource efficiency or circular economy, recycling rates, or one on land ownership. Now, these are issues that stakeholders have, have kind of highlighted. Again, just a general rationale behind things that are quite important to this portfolio. Yeah. That. I do understand that, but there are other, you know, there, there are other indicators important to this portfolio that we've actually increased the mm -hmm. number of. So this is a constant balancing exercise in and of itself. Um, the, the climate exchange has, in fact, developed indicators to monitor adaptation in Scotland, and that covers the natural environment, buildings, and infrastructure, and society themes. And they're in the Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme, so we don't actually feel that separate indicators are necessary. I think it goes back to what Roger said. We're not trying to encompass everything that's measured. Um, it, it would become an impossible exercise then, because everything that's measured is already public and available. So we're not actually, I mean, in terms of trying to inform uh, uh, the, this framework, we're trying to choose things uh, um, uh, that are I suppose, more ultimately uh, uh, fundamental. So um, there were lots of suggestions by stakeholders for indicators that would have covered things like climate change leadership or demonstration of commitments internationally. But a lot of what was being talked about would have been extremely difficult to measure. Um, uh, and the comparability, and that's the other issue that you need to remember, that, that, that there has to be an ability to make real comparisons um, uh, through time internally, but also externally when we're looking at ourselves against uh, other, other countries. So, so trying to make decisions about that uh, and keep this manageable 
Yes, it does mean that some things that some people wanted to see there are not going to be there. Other things have been brought in that weren't, or are going to be brought in that weren't there previously. Of going forward from here and, and the subject of measurement, how will the outcomes and indicators be measured going forward? What future work is planned? For example, um, with the climate change indicators for greenhouse gases and carbon footprint, will those identify a target against which to track progress? And would, it, would inevitably those be revisited after the climate bill? Rob, Sarah, do you want to? Um, so, the, the, as, as you're well aware, under the Climate Change Act, there is a target for the um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. That's one of the key indicators in the framework, and that's staying in the framework. The um, precise formulation of it and the target will need to be updated in the framework following the bill. Um, <coughs> as regards the carbon footprint, um, that's been in the framework for several years, and it's remaining in the framework. Um, whether there is anything um, in relation to the carbon footprint indicator that happens through the bill process um, remains to be seen. Um, and if it does, then yes, the frame, national performance framework will need to be um, brought up to date with that. So is it a living document in yeah. many ways? It has to be, really, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's a constant process, yeah. and, I, and, and I think that that's, you know, I mean, obviously, it, there has to be an iteration of it at some point, yeah. but at no point, I think, should it be seen to be some kind of final document for good and all, because that's not how we're working. We're constantly looking at this okay. um, over, over a number of years, and, I, you know, I've referenced things that kind of happened before the review because they were important for the review, but it will just keep, keep moving. That's fine. Donald Cameron will be followed by John Scott. Thank you, Kavina. Um, Kavina mentioned this, um, but I want to ask specifically about recycling rates and why that appears to have been considered but not uh, ultimately um, included. You want specific reasons why? Yes. Right. OK, if you could just give me a couple of... Sorry. Sorry. The, the effectively, um, uh, I think the... There's a lack of a circular economy indicator. Now, are you talking about that, or are you talking about a very specific waste recycling? Being considered, but then not ultimately included. <clears throat> well, okay. We have a waste generated measure, which is very similar. So, you know, do you have a second one? Or do you accept that the waste generated measure uh, is similar enough to, to deal with the figure that you're talking about? And this is back to replication of, of indicators. Um, we chose waste generated rather than recycling. Um, uh, and that's because waste prevention is further up the hierarchy um, than recycling. So um, some of the conversations that we have about the issues in and about, for example, food waste. And, you know, Claudia Beamish and I have had th this conversation both in the chamber and, 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 and privately just about, um, you know, what we're actually talking about food when we're talking food waste. And our targets in terms of food waste are about prevention, not recycling. So, so in a sense, we've chosen the slightly hierarchically higher uh, uh, measurement for a particular... Um, uh, basis and because of that because prevention is higher up the hierarchy then it fits we think better into the sustainability the broader sustainability um, discussion that we were talking about earlier I, you know yes there are many indicators of uh, um, of waste and you know I dare say if we legislate for the food waste target, then people may want to argue that that should be part of this. There will be lots and lots of different things that you could put in. Um, uh, but uh, if you put everything in, then effectively it's not really a um, functioning document. So I hope at least that explains why we went the way we did. I mean, there is a logic to that. It's not a, <laughs> it wasn't a random thing. Okay. Uh, John Scott, followed by Mark Roscoe. Thank you. 
Now forgive me for not knowing. It's probably my own stupidity, but what are the criteria for identifying what should be an indicator and, 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 and what should not be? It, it seems a kind of arbitrary process. I mean, how are we to judge whether you, the government, are getting it right, we, this committee? How are we to judge? Uh, is there an identifiable list somewhere that we can sort of go and check and say, yes, the government's making a good job of this, the government's not making a good well, job? We do benchmark. So we do look at what um, uh, w w what is you know, seen in, in other places that, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at as well to make sure we're not missing things that, that would be uh, seen internationally. Um, but, but there are a couple of things I would say, and I'm, you know, I can see Roger's itching to come in here, but before he does, um, uh, I, I would say amongst other things, what's really important is that what you've got is able to be actually captured in terms of of information and is is robust and is able to be compared chronologically with what's gone before because otherwise you can't actually you know show performance uh, or indeed uh, as I indicated with with a, with a kind of broader benchmarking internationally so you're picking indicators that that are actually meaningful uh, but the meaningfulness is not just how meaningful it sounds in a subjective sense. It has to objectively be meaningful as well. Uh, and that's, a, that's an important part of what... There's no point picking an indicator which, when you publish it, is, is open to too much uh, uh, dubiety about what you've actually measured. So I don't know, Roger, Roger if you want to... It comes in. I mean, self-evidently, what we're in the process of doing is evaluating whether or not the government is making a good job in this process. And, and, and we don't, it's not easy to, to know how to do that, since the criteria are not entirely clear against which you're working, and therefore it's harder for us to, to get a handle on this. It, it, it's not easy, because it's actually quite a... a, a, a a large and time-consuming process that, that we're going through. But at the end of the day, any indicators have got to be objectively robust. They've got to be capable of being measured, uh, uh, as I said, in time, backwards and forwards. But they've also, in my view, uh, I, from, from Scotland's perspective, got to be able to be looked at across the board and with international comparators as well. I mean, the, the, there are, the, the, the government produces a vast amount of data, huge amount of statistics, um, some of it very, very uh, um, uh, singular to Scotland uh, for very obvious reasons. And if you chose something out of that, then it wouldn't really give you much of a perspective about where you were in terms of national performance, I don't think. If you're, if you're wanting to look uh, across and out beyond our boundaries. So, so that's an aspect of what we're looking at, as well as the ability for that data to be tested uh, and to be considered to be highly robust and very understandable. Um, I don't want to stray into other people's portfolio areas, but there are, you know, for example, uh, and, and I, don't, I haven't looked at the justice performance stuff, but I, I do know from my former days that the difference between, you know, incidents reported and crimes reported and all the rest of it, which are all, you know, very important, nevertheless can lead to a misunderstanding and a confusion. So we don't want, the, we don't want there to be that kind of confusion here. We want it to be straightforward. Roger. Uh, just a, a few things. First of all, um, the, we're doing this review under a, a Community Empowerment Act. Uh, which means we need to review and just present the outcomes. Uh, uh, but we've decided to go beyond that and present the, the whole of the national performance framework, including the indicators. And the, the criteria that we used uh, were in the consultation document that we, we put into Parliament, but I'll go through them um, for, for looking at indicators. So there's a technical assessment, and that was based upon international best practice as laid out by the Royal Statistical Society. So that looks uh, as... Uh, Ms. Conan said uh, 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 things about consistent, making sure that they're consistent. Uh, the data is consistent over time. It's consistent between areas. Uh, that it, the data on which uh, it's based is precise enough to um, to identify change and so on. But then there's uh, another sort of criteria which is about the the meaningfulness of of indicators. So. 
Um, yeah. That's really to, to make sure that they, they have meaning to, to people, um, that we identified in our, in our workshops, that was part of that, uh, that en enables us to measure progress against each of the 11 outcomes uh, and, and avoid any major gaps in, in measurement, uh, that we want to be as consistent as possible with the UN Sustainable Development Goal Indicators, uh, and that we also finally wanted to make sure that we were describing progress not just for Scotland, but where we have data for different equality groups in Scotland and areas uh, as looking based upon the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. And in fact, when it comes to reporting, uh, we publicly report uh, <coughs> progress against each one of the indicators on our Scotland Performance website. So if we had good Wi-Fi in here, any of us could go through and check now exactly what the state is of, of that data. What we will be doing in reporting is moving from a place where we had uh, just report on progress for Scotland overall to one we're reporting on the different equality groups and uh, area-based inequalities as well. Uh, briefly, Mark Roscoe that you considered on uh, air quality. It was the lives lost through poor air quality. And I'm reading here that um, the government rejected this because they wanted more of a whole system measure. Um, could you explain that? Because on, on the face of it, there's perhaps no better indicator of whether the whole system is working as to whether people's health is being impacted or not through a multiplicity of air pollution sources. So what, why was that indicator rejected and what, what replaces it? Um, I, I, I think if I could, if I could just pick up first, when w one of the difficulties is with that particular area, um, it is ascribing um, the uh, the cause and effect um, uh, very precisely, which is not really capable of being done. I know there are a lot of figures being banded about, but one of the awkward uh, aspects of that is that it it is it is it varies enormously depending on. Uh, uh, individuals, people, uh, uh, individual people's um, uh, responses to air quality. Um, the, there, there is, there was a, a 2010 uh, 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 report which did um, produce estimates of the burden of added mortality associated with ambient fine particulate pollution at UK level. Um, but that was based on particulate levels in 2008. And I think that's another problem with, with some of that sort of measurement is that the, the time lag that's involved creates a real, uh, real issue. Um, that report, uh, uh, which was a UK government department report, um, however, noted there was an enormous variation across uh, the UK. Um, and in actual fact, for Scotland, the, the attributable life lost was less than compared to England and Wales. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that we, we would really see that as being a particular, it was measured in months, by the way, um, and I'm not sure that we felt that that was a particularly useful way to, to go forward in terms of uh, trying to do this. Um, uh, the, the actual government department that instructed that themselves advised against using um, these statistics um, because they're, they're, they're not precise enough to be particularly helpful. Now, that doesn't mean um, that we will not continue to look at this if there, is a, if there is a better and more effective way to measure it. But at the moment, as an indicator in something like this, it, we don't think it would really help us across Scotland and part of that will be down to the very, uh, very particular, very localised impacts of some of this for certain populations. So it, it, from a, as a national indicator, it doesn't, it's not particularly helpful. Sorry, Moving on, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and, and the team. Um, I need to declare an interest, um, as uh, Roger Halliday has already highlighted, that I represent Scottish Labour on the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Derek Mackay's roundtable on the National Performance Framework. Um, as such, I've sort of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to. Yes, I, I, can I just 
just say, convener, that I really feel that a body of image should be here. <laughs> well, yes, as, as my colleague um, Mark Ruskell says, feel free to ask me questions, but that's quite <laughs> not the point. No, I have actually stepped a little back from the, 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 more, um, the broader questions about the indicators and deliberately because of that. Um, and I would like to ask some specific questions about the marine environment. Um, and just to highlight that my colleague um, Stuart Stevenson will be asking about the fish, fish stocks indicators. So if we could um, take, a, take a pause on that until we come to, um, to my colleague on that. Um, I'd like to ask what the process for developing the new indicators um, was and who was involved in that. I think that would be a helpful start, please. I think that's probably for Roger. Is it you yeah. to answer? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm afraid I wasn't involved at that granular level of, mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of proceedings. Thank you, yes. Uh, the basis of it is that Marine Scotland um, has been looking at um, the indicators that have been required both for um, issues such as the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and over a, a, a couple of years have been looking at how we can best meet the requirements of uh, those particular aspects together with um, servicing and being able to answer questions on delivery with respect to the vision of having clean seas, healthy seas, biologically diverse seas. And so we've gone through a process, and when I say we, Marine Scotland has gone through a process uh, whereby we've looked at the indicators uh, that exist together with the fact that as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, we want indicators that are able to tell us something, that we're able to act upon. And so we've gone through a process of review uh, such that at the end of the day we've concluded on developing indicators that are associated with the cleanliness of our seas, the biodiversity of our seas, the sustainability of our fishing. Thank you. Um, could, could you just highlight for us um, uh, some of the range of the groups that were... Um, consulted and in discussions with yourselves on that, on the marine indicators, simply because there have been some concerns expressed about um, uh, where, where, where things have, have gone, and I'll just highlight that in a minute, but I'd be interested to know if you could highlight for us who was involved. I know, for instance, that the Scottish Environment Link was, and if there were other groups that you could just highlight for the committee. I just saw something in passing um, a few minutes ago. If you just bear with me, I, I did see a... Uh, where did the... 14? I just asked... Um, no, wouldn't. Sorry, it's just that I saw it when we were, yeah. when we were discussing earlier on a slightly different yeah. subject. Ah, here's some of the, the, some of the people that were involved. Scottish Environment Protection Agency uh, uh, was involved, and I dare say they would have had quite a lot to say about that. Um, I'm just looking at the moment about some of the... Uh, Scottish Environment Link, Marine Conservation Society. Um, uh, um, Scottish Wildlife Trust, I think probably would have had. WWF, um, uh, Friends of the Earth. Um, were, were involved. Um, uh, so I think you would have known about Marine Conservation Society because they're a roundtable member as well, um, she said pointedly. as <laughs> well. Yeah, and Scottish Wildlife Trust. Now they were involved. Scottish Wildlife and Trust, uh, Wildlife Trust were involved in indicator workshops, online survey and structured uh, conversations. Friends of the Earth were involved in indicator workshops. Um, uh, sorry, Friends of the Earth were involved in online survey. WWF were involved in indicator workshops. Um, and I'm trying to see if there was any on this other. As I said, SEPA <coughs> were involved in the indicator workshops and the SDG workshops. Um, I think that probably, yeah. Thank you. I mean, that probably covers the ones that that, that yeah. you you yes. might think would have had a, an issue around some oh, of this thank stuff. You. Marine um, Conservation Society, obviously, being the most prominent of the yeah. third sector. Thank you. Groups. That's helpful. Um, could you um, help us with 
the next question, perhaps, which was um, that the development of the marine and terrestrial ecosystem health indicators was considered. Um, and I do see that um, in, our, in our notes that um, it says to be developed, which I would m highly welcome, the diversity index of both la land and marine environments. But I'm just wondering if there's any comment from yourself, Cabinet Secretary, or anyone else um, who's with us this morning on the decision not to include the um, marine and terrestrial ecosystem health indicators, if there's any comment on that. Um, I, I think the feeling was um, that, that those ecosystem health indicators that are currently published by SEPA are um, too limited in their coverage of the marine environment, uh, particularly when it comes to the state of the offshore environment. Um, and uh, that's why Marine Scotland went to uh, the framework, the, the Marine Strategy Framework uh, uh, Director's Indicators instead, Director's Indicators instead. Um, there's a proposed new biodiversity indicator which aims to provide an indicator that captures the state of both terrestrial and marine biodiversity, and that's, I think, currently in development. That's right. Yes. I think that's that's helpful in that uh, it, it, I think I, I understand it only focused on terrestrial birds before and and now yeah. it, we're it, it looking can, at how that can be, can be brought, more widely be drawn more, more widely um, considered yeah um, so could, could I just move us very specifically and finally from my perspective to um, if I can get the phrase right the contaminant region co region combinations um, assessment which um, I wonder if there could be a short exclama um, ex ex exclamation perhaps, um, e explanation from yourself, Cabinet Secretary, or from one of the panel today. See what I have been given yes. <laughs> as an explanation. Yeah. If it doesn't suffice, perhaps one of my <laughs> colleagues yeah. here. And, and, and if I just say that um, I'm, I'm interested to know how that will fit into the marine environment assessment, because it is a complex assessment yeah. arrangement. Um, and will that be part of the overall indicator for okay. the marine environment? Right. There are, there are, as I understand it, five groups of contaminants that are monitored annually in four regions around Scotland. Um, uh, and that's uh, covering both um, fish and shellfish and sediment. Um, for the fish, for the, for the, for the, animals, if you like, and sediment in turn, and this is where I'm afraid, you know, you, you have to have some understanding of how this science works. The mean concentration of each contaminant group, and remember there are five, and we're talking about four different regions, and two, and two measurements, the, the animals and the sediment. Each contaminant group in each region is compared to a threshold, and that's typically called the environmental assessment criterion. If, the mean, if that mean concentration is below the threshold, then the contaminant group is unlikely to cause harm in marine life, and that means that the specific contaminant, specific region combination has good environmental status. But you can see with five contaminants, four regions, and two <laughs> groups being measured, the combinations are actually quite uh, extensive. So um, effectively what it would give is 40 different assessments of environmental status, that, that single way of looking at things. Um, and the indicator will be the proportion of these that show good environmental status. So the, the, the indicator would basically you know, be, be a broad brush across all of those 40. So if more than 20 show good environmental status, then it's going up the way. If less than 20, then it's going down the way, and et cetera. Um, but it's, it's, it's overlying this myriad of different pieces uh, of information. So um, we need to adapt it to assess 
Scotland's marine environment by focusing it on the four <coughs> regions around Scotland. So that's the Northern North Sea, Scottish Continental Shelf, the Minches, and the west, west of Scotland and the Irish Sea. And what we're going to try and do is provide an overall indicator out of all of that underlying information to, to, to indicate the cleanliness of Scotland's marine environment. Um, an overall assessment of the marine environment is going to need other indicators, and that's where things like fish stocks uh, and biodiversity come in. So I, I, I kind of hope that is the way it's been explained to me, I'm, you know, reproducing that explanation. There may be more technical bits of information required there. On as far as we need to go on the technicalities. <laughs> Is that more information um, than you wanted? Uh, well, uh, it's, no, I think no, it, it, no, it demonstrates the complexity. And, and actually, it, yeah. it sort of, I hope, um, uh, answers in some sense um, one of the points raised by my colleague John Scott in that we do want to know how are these things measurable. And, and this is measurable. So my... my Final question is, um, if anyone can clarify for us how regularly this, this testing will be done so that we can see the differences um, before I hand over to my colleague, Stuart Stevenson, on the fisheries. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we take samples every year uh, in January. We undertake uh, a cruise which goes right around Scotland, which covers all four regions, and we collect the samples on an annual basis. July, I might ask if I could come with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, and let me just start a couple of things for the record. Um, the area that we're looking at uh, in relation to fish stocks is out to the 200-mile limit or an adjacent uh, jurisdiction's boundary. Right. Okay. That's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, how has the uh, indicator we're now proposing changed from the previous one? Yeah. Okay. I think this is a little outside my comfort zone. <laughs> uh, the key thing is that we wanted the new indicator to relate far more to the sustainability of uh, the actual fisheries. Uh, the current indicator uh, relates to uh, the proportion of stocks uh, that are within the total allowable catch. And that was something which didn't directly tie in with the sustainability of the actual uh, fisheries and the fish stocks. So by moving to uh, using uh, fishing mortality, that directly ties in with the uh, sustainability of the fish stocks. Okay, that, that, that's fine. The TACs, of course, are set politically and therefore may or may not relate to science. Uh, I think we would all basically accept, whereas MSY is a scientific measure. So I suspect that's a good thing. However, um, round our coasts, the different fishing areas have very different sustainabilities and MSYs for different stocks. How is that reflected in the way that we look at these things? In particular, the Clyde is, and the West Coast is uh, uh, under very big pressure on certain stocks that are relatively abundant in the North Sea. Basically, um, the work that we're doing in terms of uh, determining the what we call FMSY, which is um, the fishing mortality rate that will give us maximum sustainable yield, that is determined, as you say, uh, on specific stocks. And the stocks... Um, in specific areas, so stocks in the uh, North Sea, stocks in the, in the West Coast, and as you say, stocks in, in the Clyde. The key thing is that we are measuring these stocks to try and ensure that each of the stocks are sustainable. But then what we're going to look at is the percentage of these stocks across the whole area, which are actually within FMSY. Just before you proceed, you said the area... Are you referring to the whole of the Scottish waters or are you referring to the particular fishing areas, you know, it's area 4A, 4B, yes. etc.? Particular fishing areas right. uh, is what we're looking at. So each area you are looking at. Yes. But of course we're ending up with one indicator. Yes. So how does, if, you know, areas 
4A and 4B are doing very well for Haddox, but Area 7 is doing incredibly badly for Haddox. How is that reflected in the indicator? What will happen is that um, we will have the basic data for each of the, the areas. So we'll have, say, the Haddock data for uh, the west, the Haddock data for the east, and that will give us the specific value uh, for these areas. Now, as I say, the, the final indicator as it will appear will be the percentage of these stocks which are within FMSY, but we will have the data for the specific stocks in the specific areas, uh, which will be underlying the, the, the final indicator that's quoted. Do, do, do forgive me, I understand that there is a huge amount of data and I'm confident that that's being measured, recorded and published. But I'm, I'm back to that we end up with one indicator. You know, in other words, if the, the Haddock stocks in the west coast of Scotland vanish to far below FMS, MSY, does that mean that that indicator goes red, even though the haddock stocks everywhere else are, which, if, if, if that area was not being considered, would be green and certainly green? The point you've picked up is um, a very relevant point in terms of the fact that in any indicators where you're taking data and you're trying to get it down into one uh, specific outcome, there is a chance that you would lose some of the underlying granularity. Um, and based on the percentage as it is, it wouldn't necessarily go red should one of the stocks go, um, as you say, go, go down, so that in effect the, the spawning stock biomass uh, goes below uh, the limit that is acceptable, so below BLIM. However, in uh, and, and this is again a wee bit where in planning and developing the indicator, we will be looking at the granularity of it. And so... Do, do forgive me. I'm, I'm absolutely content yep. that Marine Scotland will be managing at a granular level and responding to granular problems. And I absolutely understand that. I'm not, and I'm not trying to suggest otherwise. On the contrary, I'm content that's happening. It really is just how... We're trying to produce a relatively small number of indicators, albeit it's more than 50 that appears to be the international standard. And I'm just wondering what the value of the indicator that relates to this actually is. When it might be green, but you've got very significant problems that are geographically constrained. And, I, and you know, that's my, that's my issue. Now, I'm perfectly persuadable, but, but I just don't get it at the moment. I mean, I suppose, uh, you know, at one level, it's a, a similar, you know, response to the, the, the one on contaminants. You, you have so much detailed information that any one of these or any handful of these could drop below what would be considered an acceptable, but the overall picture remains good. Um, that, I suppose, from my perspective, would apply equally in the situation that you're talking about <coughs> And in a sense, a little bit of the same conversation was picked up on the air quality one as well, because we know that for vast parts of Scotland, air quality is fine, that there are very small areas where it isn't. So, you know, a national indicator in those circumstances, trying to find the right way of expressing that, and, and that applies in this, in this as well. I mean, you know, to a certain extent, even some of the regions that we're talking about are artificial. You could, in, you know, you could, you could change the, the regional boundaries for measurement and come to completely different um, outcomes. So they're a bit arbitrary to start with. So I, I, I would have thought that, that it remains, from my perspective, it would remain the case that if we're talking about haddock stocks, if haddock stocks were good in all but one region, then overall the picture is good. That doesn't mean clearly, as a government, that you're not going to be looking at the problem that is in one area, but it doesn't pull down the whole of the national picture unless there is more than one area with the same problem. And I, I guess that's really where we are with a lot of this. Um, and a lot of the indicators will have this very detailed granular information 
lying beneath them. But at the end of the day, every single statistic we have is compiled from a set of, you know, myriad things that are good, middling and bad. And we amalgamate them to produce a picture um, in almost every bit of statistical information which is put out there. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm perfectly content with that, and I think it touches on really all the indicators, is, is the real point. It's Probably. A philosophical yeah. point. Um, I just want to ask a little bit about fishing mortality and how we assess that, uh, because many of the landings are not at our ports, even though the fish were caught in our waters. And I just wonder, indeed, 60% of our uh, catch is in foreign vessels. Uh, many of the foreign vessels land at our ports, but many of them don't. Particularly uh, if they're up at the top left, it may be much more convenient to go to Norway, for example. So how, and how do we deal with that mortality? And in relation to mortality, are we only looking at the commercial stocks or are we looking at things that are not commercial stocks? that are part of the mortality of the fishing process, and how do we account for that? Uh, thank you. Fishing mortality, as you're probably aware, um, is quite difficult to measure per se. So what we have to do is we have to, first of all, uh, measure the abundance of the different stocks within the different areas, and we do that uh, through our classical fisheries surveys. The point you're making in terms of uh, the fact that some of the fish caught within our waters are landed elsewhere um, is the reason why uh, the assessment is done uh, through the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, where we actually take the data not just from uh, Scotland, but from Norway, from uh, other, other, other countries um, around, for example, the North Sea. And what we do is, therefore, we, we work out the, the, um, uh, the abundance of the fish, and then we work out um, the sort of catchability uh, of the fish to allow us to calculate the fishing mortality rate. But as I say, we do that in conjunction uh, with other countries. So what we have is we have surveys that are common to Scotland and common to the other uh, ICES member states. And indeed, the fisheries, uh, the ships that we use are calibrated. The other thing we do is that across the ICES area, um, the scientists uh, analyze, uh, sorry, they, they, they pick up fish at the um, landed, uh, landing ports. Uh, we try to, across uh, the, the uh, fishing communities, measure 200 fish per 1,000 tons of fish landed, which actually means that across the ICES area, uh, we analyze 1.6 million fish uh, a year. And so we're taking a huge sample of the population, but not just from the Scottish ports, but from the whole of uh, a specific area that we're analysing. And that's how we take account of, of uh, determining fishing mortality in the areas where we have multiple countries involved. Let's go briefly. Why precautionary enough for all fish stocks? Because uh, I've heard arguments that with pelagic fish that we should be fishing, the effort should be aiming for a target below MSY? The MSY is, is set, but we do have um, precautionary limits related to the spawning stock biomass, so what we call BPA. And we don't just look at fishing mortality. We look at the spawning stock biomass because one of the challenges that we have is that in any one year, the fish year class may vary quite significantly. And so that's why we assess the current state of the population. And what we can see is year classes coming through the system. So if we have a particularly good um, year when there's a lot of little fish born, then what will happen is in a few years' time, we will see that year class uh, become very large. And therefore, we know that the abundance uh, has increased. So actually, it's a very fluid uh, picture uh, that we have with the uh, specific the, the pelagic stocks that you, you mentioned uh, we, we assess those in a slightly different way uh, because with the demersal stocks those that are on the ground we do it through trawling and capture uh, with the um, likes of mackerel uh, we do a, a mackerel egg survey and so 
uh, we have to measure the stocks in slightly different ways uh, in order to come up with uh, the required information. But the key thing is that, you know, to relate it to um, FMSY or, or fishing mortality, maximum sustainable yield, um, it's not just that particular value that we are taking when we are doing the actual calculations. It's a good indicator in terms of providing information in relation to the National Performance Framework, but as part of the overall picture, we also take about account of the um, spawning stock biomass. Carson. The change in the biodiversity indicator, as we heard earlier, uh, it's been broadened to include uh, terrestrial and marine biodiversity. Uh, can I ask, uh, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to put two or three questions all together to make it easier for you to answer. Um, why is that there's no clear descriptor for the biodiversity indicator? And can you provide more details on what the marine uh, biodiversity indicator will be? Uh, and on the back of that, is, is the current monitoring activity in place to provide the data for this indicator with regards to, to you know, baselining, or will new monitoring activity need to be developed? Uh, right, okay. Um, we're actually still uh, uh, developing the new indicators, so um, it would be difficult for me to answer very specific questions about, about that, simply because that's still in the process of development. Um, we are trying to develop that so that it does cover both marine uh, and land. One thing that we are looking at is, is to expand the, and I think Claudia Beamish referred to this in, in something that she said, is to expand the current indicator, which is based on terrestrial birds, to cover both seabirds and wetland birds. But we don't want to close off our options at this stage. So that is one thing that we are currently looking at. There's another possibility, which would be to select a number of key species um, from each environment, terrestrial and marine, and to assess each in terms of their direction of travel, how healthy, how not healthy they are, and then make some overall assessment. Um, but those are things that we are still looking at in terms of how we are going to develop this new biodiversity indicator. And I'm not quite sure what the time scale is for us actually getting something that's more definitive. Have you, do we have a time scale for that? We, we, do, we do, yes. We want to have it developed by 2019. Okay. Um, and one of the key things is that there are already indicators uh, relating to marine birds, uh, marine bird abundance and marine bird breeding success uh, or, or failure, uh, which are reported for uh, the Greater North Sea and indeed for our West Coast. So we do have uh, a data stream which allows us to um, report uh, currently on the status of, of marine uh, birds. And indeed, uh, this was reported on um, by the OSPAR Commission as part of its intermediate assessment 2017 uh, last year, um, where in fact, just to give you an example of the number of biodiversity indicators, um, they were actually using 25 individual biodiversity indicators to try and assess biodiversity uh, in uh, our seas, which gives you an idea of, of, of the number. In fact, they hope that they're probably going to increase that to about 40 uh, different indicators. The good thing is that in, in the likes of birds and cetaceans and seals, we do have a significant amount of data already. Okay, that, that was my next question. Is, is there enough scientific knowledge of the biodiversity? Who, who will you uh, consult, or, or who are you consulting at the moment uh, with regards to uh, that indicator? And will the indicator be aligned with EU and international biodiversity strategies? Well, I've already read out a number of the um, relevant groups who have been involved in the consultations, and they will have been involved in that, in that uh, 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 consultation in respect of biodiversity. I expect some of them, Marine Conservation Society, WWF, etc., will have been more interested in this than perhaps some of the others. So they're already uh, um, actively involved in that, and I, uh, I, I don't know whether there's an intention for it to to be more specific uh, and beyond those groups, I would imagine that a lot of the individuals that we've talked about, the academic 
uh, input, et cetera, will be relevant here too. Yes. I, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, but, but the, 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 that indicator will have been discussed um, uh, along with others um, as part of the work that has been getting done already. Yes. Uh, th there has just been a, 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 a workshop, um, which was at a UK level, on biodiversity indicators, um, and it covered a, a significant range of organisations, Joint Nature Conservation Committee, SEPA, Scottish Natural Heritage, Environment Agency, um, Marine Scotland, um, and the other thing is that uh, in terms of some of the indicators that I've mentioned, um, as part of the UK's <coughs> commitment to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, um, the report on the UK position relative to uh, the indicators for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, that's going out to general consultation later this year. So all the indicators that we've used to date in terms of biodiversity uh, will be put out for full public consultation. Uh, and yes, in terms of the international um, thing, we are uh, um, a contracting party to the OSPAR Convention. So uh, um, uh, uh, that, that would be part and parcel of, 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 of our thinking. We, we, we're involved in those international organisations. And I've indicated frequently, I think, that I want to ensure that Scotland continues to be able to perform um, in terms of its international obligations notwithstanding anything, any word beginning with B. <laughs> Fascinating work in progress. Could I secure from your commitment, Cabinet Secretary, to update the committee uh, in due course as that progresses? Because it's obviously something we're going to take an interest yeah. in. Um, do, do you want us to uh, um, make the updating the specific things that the committee has expressed an interest in this morning or specific just in broader well, general any, terms? Anything in general, but I think this specific... Uh, theme okay. that we're exploring at the moment around biodiversity. I think we'll obviously be interested okay. in how that okay. progresses. Um, one final line of questioning from uh, Donald Cameron. Um, this is a, I suppose, a very general question, but um, one of the issues that emerges is policy coherence and uh, the fact, I think, in an endeavour that we all share, which is that different policy areas can work together. And my question really is, how will the um, framework support the development of a coherent policy uh, across both across government and wider and the wider public sector where do you see it helping well i suppose first of all it's 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 trying to give an objective picture um uh, uh across economic environment and social progress so that in and of itself uh, is an important um, part of when we're looking at policy development, getting that sense of an objective picture of, of where we are. Um, we will, uh, as ministers, I think, continue to use uh, the data alongside other evidence. Now, I mean, obviously, the national, as we've already explored, there's a great deal more information out there um, uh, that, uh, that can be added to uh, specific policy areas. Um, so we take the National Performance Framework information, but also a lot of the other evidence that we've already discussed uh, here to ensure that we are making progress coherently. That, that, that's an ongoing process, as you would expect. And I would assume that almost any government would be trying to do um, precisely the same thing. Um, the indicators are obviously available to ministers and the wider public at the same time through our website. So we don't get you know, we get advised of progress in terms of the National Performance Framework at the same time as the whole of Scotland gets advised of it. Um, and we see straight away whether areas within our own cabinet responsibilities are improving or otherwise, um, or are simply level pegging. So that's something that we are constantly getting updated on. I mean, I, I think that is, that is, that is, I'm trying to think that there's probably a cycle for doing it, but it seems to come through relatively frequently. So it is something that we are having put in front of us as, 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 as cabinet secretaries responsible for particular policy areas um, for us to be able to look at. And that does then, from my perspective, lead to a, a, a return, you know, uh, 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 response on mine. Well, why is that going down? What, what's behind that story there 
is there something different we should be doing? And that's, in a sense, really what this is, is, is all about. Um, and uh, I would have expected, um, and I don't know how true it is, but I would have expected parliamentary colleagues to also use it for the same purpose, in effect. If the national performance framework um, uh, indicators are going in the wrong direction in any particular policy area, um, as well as the expectation that the cabinet secretary involved will be looking at that and saying, well, how has that come about? I would have expected um, uh, parliamentary colleagues um, uh, as well to be, to, be, to be looking at that and using that as an exercise, a tool in, in, in which to kind of um, uh, uh, explore um, issues in particular areas. I mean, that's effectively the, the sum total of what the national performance framework um, is there for and does. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you for that. That's been useful. Um, and you've undertaken, obviously, to update us in due course as, as matters progress. Um, thank you for giving evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend for a few moments till we uh, change your officials round, and then we'll move on to the Crown Estate Bill. So I suspend for a few moments.
The uh, second item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Crown Estate Bill. We are joined again by Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham and this time her officials Douglas Kerr and David Mallon and Mike Palmer. Um, Cabinet Secretary, did you wish to say anything at the outset before we move to questions? Yes, Convener, I do have an opening uh, statement in respect uh, of this item on the agenda. Um, uh, uh, just to, to set the generality that, of course, um, this Crown Estate Bill is proposing new powers for the Scottish Ministers to change who manages Scottish Crown Estate, uh, estate assets and opens up the possibility of local authorities and communities taking control of the management of those assets. The estate obviously consists of a very diverse portfolio, including thousands of hectares of rural land, half of Scotland's foreshore, urban property and seabed leasing rights for activities such as renewable energy. Um, so we quite quickly came to a view that one size fits all uh, as an approach was simply not practical. The bill therefore lays the foundation for changes in the management of individual assets. We want to maximise the benefits of the Crown Estate for communities and the country as a whole, while ensuring assets are well maintained and managed with high standards of openness and accountability. And I do know that the proposed arrangements for the Scottish Crown Estate and the bill are complex. So uh, it's understandable that there are going to be some misunderstandings in respect of this. So with that in mind, I thought it might be helpful to explain how we see the financial flows working. Um, and members, I hope, have had circulated an attempt by us to uh, produce a, a kind of paper which allows a simple uh, explanation in flowchart form. Um, how effective it is will be for you to decide. I, I'm, th this is not being circulated as a basis on which for you to you know, specifically ask questions so much as a hope that by putting it in this form, it makes life a little simpler in terms of understanding what's happening. And the first and most important thing for everybody to understand, uh, and by everybody, I know the committee will understand this already, but uh, beyond the committee, that the Scottish Crown Estate has not brought any new money into Scotland. The UK government's block grant to Scotland has been reduced by the estimated annual amount of net revenue earned by the Scottish Crown Estate assets. Under the terms of the Scotland Act, the net revenue from the estate, that's the income from leasing and licensing and all the other Crown Estate Scotland activities, minus the costs of managing the assets, is paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund. So we are clear that whoever is managing the assets has to maintain and seek to enhance the value of those assets and the income arising from them, otherwise Scotland as a whole is out of pocket. So the money earned by the Scottish Crown Estate assets can now, however, be used differently. The net revenue generated by the marine assets out to 12 nautical miles will be dispersed to the three islands local authorities and the other 23 coastal local authorities. The local funding will not be hypothecated, but we would expect the local authorities to be transparent and accountable to their communities on how that money is spent. We are in constructive discussions with COSLA on an interim mechanism for local authority areas to receive a share of this revenue, and we do expect to reach agreement on this soon. As you know, the bill places a duty on the manager of an asset to maintain and seek to enhance the value of the asset and the income arising from it. When the management of the Scottish Crown Estate assets was transferred to Scotland, we inherited the pre-existing arrangements, which meant that whoever manages the assets, currently Crown Estate Scotland interim management, I can retain 9% of the gross revenue for investment in the estate. For example, renovations and repairs to farm buildings or the purchase of new assets. Thus, before the net revenue is surrendered by the manager to the consolidated fund, this 9% figure is subtracted. We are keeping this facility in the bill, but we are taking the power to be able to vary the percentage which is subtracted in the future. It may be that some assets need more capital investment than others, and this, allows, this, this bill provision will allow a more responsive approach to be taken. And that's not the only way that managers will be able to invest in the assets that they are managing. 
At present, the Crown Estate is managed as a single estate, although there are many different types of assets. So if one part of the estate is not earning enough income to cover its maintenance and management costs, it can be subsidised by the better for performing assets. And we all know this as cross-subsidy. We want to keep this ability to cross-subsidise even when there are several managers of the assets. So we are taking powers to enable ministers to direct a manager to transfer a sum of money from that manager's account to another manager's account. And that way a community organisation should be able to take over the management of a local asset even if that asset is not in itself going to generate enough income to cover costs. To be clear, that is money which would come from a manager's Scottish Crown Estate accounts and not from any personal accounts of the manager. The bill requires a strict separation between a manager's Scottish Crown Estate accounts and any accounts of their own that they may have. And the bill also sets up a national governance framework specifying accounting and reporting procedures which should result in openness and transparency about the management of the assets, whether managed locally by communities or nationally by Crown Estate Scotland. Now, I wanted to put that statement very firmly on the record because I think there's a bit of confusion out there as to what exactly is going on with the devolution of the Crown Estate to Scotland. Okay, thank you. And we'll cover some of that as we go along. Um, to kick off, uh, my, my question would probably be around the, um, the vision and the purpose of the bill. If we were to come back here five years, ten years from now, what would be the judgment of uh, whether the bill had been a success? What, was, what would we be looking uh, for from the Crown Estate and what it was delivering for Scotland in five years, ten years from now? Well, there are probably a lot of different things that you could you could uh, um, uh, uh, say, but I, I think in, in, in total what you would want to be ensuring is that ultimately that it is operating to the benefit of Scotland and its communities. And there has been a long history of concern that the Crown Estate didn't function necessarily with community interests at forefront of, of what it was doing. That was an old criticism uh, and one which was taken up by predecessors to this, uh, to this committee. Um, and that uh, benefit of Scotland is, is obviously financial, as I've out, outlined there, but is also socioeconomic and environmental too. So it's, it encompasses uh, everything. Um, so it, that means that we, we, would, we would look to a position where managers, whoever they are, um, are actually um, placing more emphasis on, on those wider benefits um, when making uh, decisions. In five years, ten years, um, I would hope that at least some local authorities want to, uh, have wanted to take over uh, direct management. Now, most of the interest at the moment has come from a handful, Orkney, Shetland, Western Isles, um, and Highlands and Islands, I think, perhaps not even Quite Highlands and Islands, yeah, Argyll and Butte. That, but, but beyond that, there hasn't been an expression of strong interest from any other coastal local authorities. And I would hope um, that if we were looking at five or ten years into the future, more coastal local authorities will have certainly considered it and may have taken on management. But I would also hope that we saw more community organisations having done so as well. I don't want this just to be a conversation about devolution to local authorities. It should also be about local communities. Um, and I hope that a number of local communities will be uh, in position in five, ten years' time where they will have uh, taken that on. Because it was particularly local communities, I think, that felt that their interests weren't being taken into account uh, previously. Now, obviously, there's a financial issue with the net revenue issue, which I've outlined in my opening speech statement so I very much hope that when we're talking about the Crown Estate in five ten years time that it is contributing to the Scottish Consolidated Fund and not a drain on it that's obviously a fairly fundamental uh, uh, point uh, to make um, and uh, uh, you know I certainly would hope that for those local authorities that are getting the net revenue from the marine assets out to 12 uh, uh, nautical mile limit that they are using um, uh, uh, those revenues uh, for the benefit of coastal communities and that's why I made the point about the transparency and accountability while well, we're not hypothecating this money you know the, the purpose of this money effectively <coughs> is to enhance the coastal communities so in five ten years time I hope you're going to see 
if not the whole of Scotland's coast tied up in this way, nevertheless a significant percentage of it at that point would be. No, Sorry, no, did I go on too long? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I, I, actually, you weed into the kind of supplementary question right. for me, wearing a constituency and, a, and, a, and sort of area hat. Um, when you talk about this issue about there could be local authorities here are securing funding they've not had in the past, and we're talking about transparency and accountability. Would you, for example, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, a local authority inheriting a, a sum of money like this, perhaps to deploy it on issues such as coastal erosion and, and things like that when it's come from a kind of coastal source? Well, that may very well be indeed something that uh, a coastal local authority would want to, would want to consider. Um, I know, depending on which local authority we're talking about, there will be different drivers for, for what they want. But I, I think the expectation uh, uh, from, from, from us in government, as well as, I suspect, from uh, people on the ground, would be the money that any local authority uh, obtains through this mechanism is actually used for the betterment of coastal communities uh, in, in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the, the amounts of money that are transferred will be uh, transparent. You will, you will know exactly what that budget, what that money is. So uh, everybody will be able to uh, track uh, um, how that money then is, is, is spent. Um, and uh, uh, it, 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 I, I suspect it would not be a wise move for any coastal local authority to displace that money elsewhere. To be clear, is it recurring sums of money as opposed to one-off? Yeah. It's an annual, annual. It will be an annual calculation, yeah. an annual <coughs> process. So, and it, it won't be exactly the same amount of money every month because of the way uh, every year, um, but it will be yeah, roughly annual. the same. Um, and I need to make just the point here about the, the distribution mechanism that I'm talking about. There will be a shorter-term um, interim distribution mechanism to get us over the first year or two, um, uh, but the, the form of distribution may change. However, there will be uh, an understandable, logical calculation that people can look at and significant and specific amounts of money which then emanate from that to each local authority, each coastal local authority. Yeah. And you indicated there's dialogue with COSA around yes. that. How soon are we likely to get an indication of what the sums of money would be or the mechanism? Well, I think what I, I have asked officials, and I don't know whether or not they've had time to be able to do it, to give us an indicative uh, indication of what it might have looked like last year or the year before on the basis of some of the current distribution models that we're discussing for the interim process. Um, we're still hashing out with, uh, with COSLA what the, the, the more final distribution model will look like. I don't know how close we might be to that. I, that's a difficult one to gauge. <laughs> I think we, let, let me put it this way, the, the first calculation for payment will be next March for payment for the 1920 year. So uh, uh, that will have to, I think, of necessity be on a kind of interim distribution model for understandable reasons. But because the payments are <coughs> annual, it's a pretty big incentive to stay at the table until an actual decision is properly made. Information as it becomes available. Yes, we will. Thank you, then. Uh, to move on, uh, John Scott. Thank you. And just to pick up on that last question before I move on to the one, you, you said that you hope, uh, while the, the, the Crown Estates at the moment are contributors to the consolidated fund, that you hope in future that they won't be a drain on that fund and given the expectations raised, do you see that as a real risk, a real possibility that it'll end up being a, a, a net loss, as it were? To the no, I, I don't think in, in, in Scotland-wide terms. I think it, that's why we want to retain the cross-subsidy, though, because we know that in, in the case of some very specific assets, it would be difficult to, to say that you know you have to you as the new managers have got to run this at a profit um, when perhaps in specific terms that has not been the case before because in actual fact it's been getting cross subsidized it would be an unfair imposition um, uh, uh, but by maintaining the cross subsidy we are able to um, uh, allow that to be evened out across the whole of the estate um, but that's one of the reasons why 
you know, and I know there's been debates here about, you know, uh, um, what aspects of benefit are 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 important. Um, but it's why, you know, actually getting value out of the management of these estates is important. Um, I, I suppose I think it's rather than the risk that that will be the case overall, is that, that, that the, 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 the issue might be that, that people managing a local asset forget that they are actually part of that national um, figure that they would become so focused on, on their local issue that they, they, they stop seeing themselves as part of the national picture. But, you know, the, the, this is not new money. Uh, you know, it's coming in, but we've had money removed. So it is absolutely imperative that everybody who is managing a Crown Estate asset, whether that's the Crown Estate nationally itself, whether it's local authorities or whether it's communities, manages that to the very best of their ability and with that outcome of success being in the forefront of their minds. Mm. Notwithstanding, then, it would appear that it is a risk that it won't be a net contributor to the consolidated fund. Anyway, moving on and declaring an interest as a farmer, um, this, um, it, in terms of management of assets at national and local levels, in its consultation, the long-term arrangements for the Crown Estate, the Scottish Government set out a table indicating at what geographical level it considered different assets would be most appropriately managed. Does the Scottish Government still hold broadly the same view on this as it did at the time of the consultation? And what is the Government's view now on those assets that at the time of the consultation needed more consideration? Um, well, I don't think we've made absolute final decisions on... Uh, um you know, the, the, the assets split, if you like, between national and local. But what we indicated at the outset, I think, is a sensible and likely to be the basis of um, uh, how we move forward. Um, as we've already had a conversation about, not all assets um, may be sustainable in their own right. So I don't want there to be financial burdens um, placed on uh, on communities or local authorities, and I think that would be invidious. And you know, while uh, notwithstanding John Scott's pessimism, pessimism, I don't actually see from the national picture there being a, a, a risk in this. Um, it would be an unfair imposition to put people into a position or organisations into a position where they were having to manage assets that weren't uh, individually um, uh, sustainable in their own right. So. Um, what we're doing, uh, I think, uh, uh, as we go forward, will we'll be giving us really good uh, information on whether some assets are likely to require cross-subsidy. Don't forget that, that this level of detail in, in Crown Estate finances hasn't really happened before uh, in the same way. Um, and uh, uh, from a point of view of practical management, um, there, are some, there are some issues uh, which need to be taken on board. Um, we do consider um, there to be a case for the management of the seabed, particularly the 12 to 200 nautical mile zone, uh, leasing for strategic national infrastructure, such as telecoms, cables, pipelines, etc., all to be undertaken at the national level. Um, and we also you know, heard very strong... Uh, um, submissions, as I think did the committee from the, the tenant farmers on the Crown Estate, uh, landed estates, in respect of what, uh, uh, what they wanted to do. Um, and we've responded to that by taking a view that at this stage, the, that should be retained as part of the national management of the, uh, of the Crown Estate. And that could only change if, if those people who are actively involved in the farming on those estates wanted there to be some change themselves. And at this point, there is no indication um, that that's what they want to do. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry, I got handed another note, just. Okay, I'm, d I'm just uh, 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 being reminded that the rising income for renewables uh, will mean that overall net revenue is expected to increase. It goes back to your very pessimistic outlook in terms of the overall picture. Um, uh, and uh, also just to flag up that we might charge some assets at less than market value, but it's overall not expected to balance out as a drain. 
And we would be keeping a constant eye on that anyway. And that's my expectation, but of course that is determined by external factors. For example, offshore wind developments when we proceed with contracts for different support, for example. So there are factors at play that you have no control over. But, the, but the, that is the, the purpose in, in setting it up the way we have. Uh, Mike, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, in, in, in terms of the risk of, of a drain on the, on, 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 on the Scottish finances, ju just to remind the committee that Section 7 of, of the bill does place a duty on each manager to maintain and seek to enhance the value of the assets. So that's a very clear duty that is being placed on each manager, um, which I think reflects the importance that we place on, on, on the financial efficiency um, uh, of, of, of the Crown Estate in Scotland. There appear to have been promises and expectations raised in that regard that much of the income from um, the Crown Estates will now go to local communities and councils and I think there's perhaps a job to be done there in terms of managing expectations. And we'll come to that in due course. And thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, uh, so Mr. Stevenson, I beg your pardon. I, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, the managers who've taken over from the Crown Estates, particularly where they represent community interests. And the recognition has been in what's been said up till now that some of these assets that are now being managed by community bodies are in fact in accounting terms liabilities rather than uh, under Section 7. They can maintain but seek to enhance there may be very limited opportunity. And I just want to ask an accounting question. If <laughs> If, they've, if this asset, which this body, which will either presumably be a limited liability company or registered as a charity or will have some formal structure, how does it deal with the fact that its only asset is in fact a liability in accounting terms? Who stands behind them to make sure uh, that the legal requirements for them uh, to, to, to be able to balance their own internal books is met. How does that actually happen? I think that's Mr Palmer by the looks of it, but I could be wrong. Because <laughs> I'm not doing accounting no, no, questions. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I can have a first stab at that, and David might want to come in too on some of the detail. I, I mean, I think the first point to make would be that the, there would be a separation of the accounting um, between the Crown Estate elements of the accounting of that organization and any other an, um, elements so that's very important uh, uh, I, I think to understand at the outset um, uh, yeah part of my question that that very separation that the, 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 the crown and state part is separate and separately accountable but in some cases will never ever and there'll be no expectation little anything other than a drain rather but, than... But, but that is why we want to retain the cross-subsidy. Um, uh, ah, sorry, I'm, I understand that point. I'm only asking in accounting terms how is that, because is, does that mean that the cross-subsidy has to appear uh, as uh, an asset for them? And therefore they need to know what it is before they get it. Could I... Um, perhaps attempt to answer the question. Uh, I suppose it is a hypothetical question uh, and there is a prior question about whether, you know, at the end of the day, we would be kind of, uh, it would be a, a wise thing to give um, a loss-making asset uh, to another body, but um, there may be uh, situations where that is, is considered to be um, a good thing to do. And I suppose, I suppose in accounting terms, cross-subsidy is quite an important part of the the, the framework here because um, the, the accounts of that manager would not only show what income is is received um, f uh, directly by the by the manager but would also show uh, where there has been an injection of uh, funding through the cross subsidy arrangements to enable there to be you know a, um, a zero balance sheet from from year to year uh, so the, the, the accounting, I think, is, is designed to be flexible to take account of that scenario. Uh, and when it comes to the duty in Section 7 uh, to maintain and seek to enhance, um, if, if the income is zero at, pre at present, it isn't too challenging 
to, to maintain it at that level. And indeed, it may be that the asset has just been underutilised to date because the, the national manager has been focusing on bigger assets and through, uh, a, through further devolution, a local community organisation might be able to make more of that particular asset and therefore potentially enhance the value. And I think this is my final point, convener. But there will be assets which will always be a negative uh, that you might feel would be better managed by the community, but not necessarily better managed to the extent of becoming a positive income. So who, who ultimately bears the liability? Uh, in other words, where does, it, where does that liability transfer? Is it consolidated with the Crown Estate's accounts or the government's accounts? Whose accounts? Because obviously what appears in one balance sheet as a liability has to appear in another balance sheet in these circumstances in, with the opposite sign. I think brings in the concept of the Scottish Crown Estate and it, it might not be Crown Estate Scotland, although it could be that they are providing the cross subsidy, it could be coming from another manager of a Crown Estate, but the, but the, the same is the case that the, the liability has been covered by the Scottish Crown Estate rather than the community organisation in that scenario. Okay. Convener. Mr. Mr. Stevenson has taken us off on a slight tangent, but we'll, we'll stay with us just now. I see. No, no. It, 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 do we actually, or do you, have a clear picture at the moment of the liabilities of Crown Estate Scotland as things stand? Yes, um, quite a lot of work um, was done in advance of the transfer on the 1st of April 2017 to better understand the, the liabilities. And I suppose, you know, in simple terms, they mainly boil down to the landlord, landlord responsibilities um, and uh, the employee, uh, sorry, I should say the employer responsibilities. Um, and um, I think it's the landlord responsibilities that are the more um, unusual um, aspects of the, the liability. Uh, question uh, and those um, liabilities split down into contingent liabilities you know, as the landlord and also residual liabilities. Uh, by contingent liabilities uh, we mean uh, that uh, as the landlord there's an expectation that uh, after use of, of part of the estate there will be um, a, a restoration um, uh, of, of the estate to the, the condition it was uh, in before. Um, and uh, normally through the, the lease um, agreement, the, that uh, requirement to uh, restore would be for the developer to undertake in the case of, um, say, you know, um, you know, a use of farmland for mining activity. It, 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 there's an expectation that the developer would restore the, the land to a, a condition fit for farming or for another use. Uh, but the contingent, contingent liability sits with the manager because there is a possibility that that developer may not be able to honour those um, undertakings. And so as a landlord, there, there would be an expectation that the Crown Estate picks up that amount of money. Um, for residual liabilities, that's after um, the, the decommissioning of an activity. Um, and it could be that in the case of a wind farm, uh, where um, you know, government is responsible for ensuring there is a decommissioning scheme in place, um, and it is for, again, for the developer to ensure that the decommissioning scheme is, is completed. At the time of decommissioning, um, the, uh, the developer may uh, get approval not to remove all of the infrastructure uh, from the, the marine environment, and so some um, infrastructure remains in place, and the, the, the residual liability would exist in that scenario if a third party uh, was uh, subjected to damages by the, the fact of that infrastructure remaining in the water. Um, so uh, so th th those are the main liabilities. Um, th there are some uh, uh, kind of less um, specific, less um, expensive ones, for example, maintenance of property, the stewardship of the estate. I wanted to come to you, and I know Mr. Stevenson's chomping at the bit, because there, there must be a subjective element to this as well, in so much as a tenant farmer might be of a view that there is a backlog of repairs that the Crown Estate Scotland don't entirely share that view. So it must be, in some respects, difficult to entirely gauge the level of liability. I, I think there's a, the difference of opinion that may exist. There's also an, an estimation of what future requirements may be, which is, you know, requires um, assumptions to be made. 
In the case of um, lease agreements between a farmer and uh, Crown Estate Scotland at present, that, that agreement does normally make clear what is the responsibility of the, the, the Crown Estate and what is the responsibility of the farmer um, uh, farming the estate. And, and usually it's a mixture of both, but there's clarity in the agreement. So there, there could sometimes be um, a, a feeling on the part of a farmer that it is for the Crown Estate to undertake something which in actual fact Crown Estate Scotland has written into agreement is for, is for the farmer to undertake. But that usually there's dialogue between the two parties on that to try and resolve the situation. Ron Scott and then Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, uh, convener. And um, just going back to the evidence at SSEN, they stated that asset managers should be responsible for the liabilities associated with their assets, while Community Land Scotland suggested that the bill might include provisions enabling Scottish ministers to assume responsibility for liabilities when assets are managed or owned by communities. Which view does the government prefer? Should Scottish ministers assume responsibility for potential liabilities when devolving power to local community groups or not? Um, well, I think what we have done is, uh, at the moment, uh, include within the bill uh, a power um, for ministers to, in fact, um, uh, assume responsibility for potential liabilities um, when we devolve to local community groups, but we would only be looking at that on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think we want to just take a view that says, across the board, that's how we would that's how we would proceed. So that would be one of the things that got weighed up at the time uh, of of the application being made, when we would be looking into all the facts and circumstances around uh, a community group who wishes to take over that management. On a bigger scale, I think of the East Ayrshire coal fields um, where there were insufficient bonds um, created by East Ayrshire Council, as I recall, and there's a, a huge uh, liability there for the extraction of coal when all of that went terribly wrong. Um, so would you envisage a system of insurance like that, of bonds uh, being established by those who use the assets? I mean, I think essentially what, what, what the bill is proposing is, is that these, these cases are taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and um, I, I think there would have to be a judgment made on each business case that was being put forward. I think we would, we would ordinarily expect um, uh, that in most cases of community organizations or local authorities coming, coming forward with proposals to manage assets, um, that, that, they, that, that, that both the, um, uh, the, the assets and the liabilities would, would be being transferred to them. And one would normally expect that that, that, that that would be an incentive behind the business case that they would be coming forward with. Um, you would not expect organisations particularly to wish to manage maybe a, a, an asset where they, they were at risk of taking on liabilities that they really didn't feel that they could... Um, that, that they could deal with and, and where you might need to get into some quite complex arrangements around bonds. However, um, what we're trying to set up here is, is, a, is, is a kind of discretionary system that is open to any kind of case coming forward and then that needs to be considered in the round and, it needs, and, and all of those issues around whether it's reasonable for liabilities to be managed away from that community organisation um, more on a national level is reasonable and that's something that, that it's felt could be agreed to or not, that that would need to be considered um, at the point that that case comes forward. I, I think just to, I mean, basically the presumption is that the liabilities would pass to the new managers as well as the asset. That, that would be the normality and I would have expected that in the vast majority of cases that would happen without much, you know, discussion or conver uh, conversation. There may be the odd occasion when a bigger conversation has to be had around liabilities and we've allowed for that. But the presumption we're operating under is that organisations will take on liabilities as well as the asset, which is what you would expect in the normal course of events. Uh, absolutely. I just want to be absolutely clear um, because it's for the once in a generation inadvertent uh, liabilities that emerge that 
couldn't have been foreseen, and then who's the banker of last resort yeah, in that I regard? Mean, I, Presumably you know, I, the Scottish I, government. But these are all issues that, that, that we have to deal with all the time. I mean, the, the, you know, that's not, that's, not, that's not a conversation <coughs> that you wouldn't have to have in government across a whole range of things, not just the Crown Estate. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, the, the, what we're talking about here is trying to put in place, you know, a system where there's a presumption um, and that's how it will operate unless there's a very particular set of circumstances. For the unforeseeable, well, I, I, you know, no legislation can legislate for the unforeseeable. Thank you, Stuart. And then Claudia Beamish. It was just a very small point on what Mr. Marlon had said about marine assets and decommissioning. The phrase used was residual liabilities. I don't recognise that phrase. I only recognise liabilities and contingent liabilities. I presume that actually we were talking about these being contingent liabilities. In other words, there is no liability until a future contingency occurs, and therefore it would not have to be in the numbers and provided for financially by the manager, albeit it might be, although there would have to be reference to that in the notes to the accounts. Yes, you're right that they're all either residual or contingent. They're all theoretical liabilities rather than actual liabilities. Uh, the, just to clarify, the, the residual liability is a phrase which has been used by the UK government uh, in the decommissioning schemes uh, for uh, offshore renewables. OK, which... it's just not in the International Financial Reporting Standard. Yeah. It's my point. Right, thank you, convener. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, convener. And just to seek a, a bit of brief clarification in relation to the supporting of community ownership. Um, and um, organisations such as Community Land Scotland have welcomed the inclusion of community organisations um, as one of the possible potential um, asset managers. Um, and what will community organisations have to do to prove they're capable of running a, a Crown Estate Scotland asset? And what support will um, CES and others provide to them? And what monitoring will be provided to ensure reassurance, but also allowing community organisations to be in control? Um, well, uh, I, I think what we're uh, trying... Well, first of all, can we just remind ourselves that, that, that it's not the ownership of the Crown Estate that's being passed over, it's management, fundamentally. So I, I just... Yeah, I, 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 I just worry a little when there's a, a, a sort of shorthand used that, that makes it feel as if somehow ownership is, is what's involved in this. Um, I would very much hope that communities are going to, uh, uh, to step forward um, uh, in terms of um, uh, taking over local assets because I think I referred to in my opening remarks that it was actually uh, communities that were most critical in the past of uh, how things were being managed uh, and they felt not in, in, in their specific uh, interests. Um, Members will be aware um, that there are also pilots that are going to be um, uh, uh, launched uh, in respect of this, and we're going to follow their progress pretty closely um, in terms of how, uh, uh, how that works. Um, and the experience of those pilots are going to inform some of the decision-making process around transfer and uh, delegation. Uh, in terms of the support for communities, um, uh, we um, have uh, in place um, the capacity, the existing capacity to actually support communities um, at an early stage when they are, in the same way we do with uh, those who are coming forward with an intention to register um, interest in community right to buy. If, if anybody's been involved with a community doing that, they will know that there is an enormous amount of support available from officials at that very early process to make sure that their application is in the best shape it can be. And that is something that we want to build into this system as well, so that communities that do come forward with, uh, uh, with an idea that they would like to think about this, that they can actually have an early conversation um, and get early support in respect of how, um, how they proceed. And I think I'm right in saying uh, 
um, uh, that there will be um, actual grants available um, for communities to help them in terms of the capacity that they have to come forward with an application as well. Um, uh, if I can find the specifics around that, I, uh, um, I, will, I, will, I will do so. But um, So we want to make, that there will be kind of financial support, but, but from my perspective, knowing about communities that have wanted to progress right to buy, the, the more important support is actually the support they get from officials right from the outset. To, to help them through this process. And it will be one of the Crown Estate's jobs to be as facilitative as possible um, with communities uh, uh, who express uh, uh, an interest. Yes, I'm just being reminded that Section 31 of the Bill, Clause 31 of the Bill, um, uh, does provide for grants for preparation for management changes. So, so there are, there, there's going to be different kinds of support uh, available um, for communities um, and it, it will be interesting to see how many do want to step forward. Um, uh, it's, uh, at, at the moment there are some expressions of interest from communities as opposed to um, authorities um, <coughs> but not an enormous number and it may be that the publicity about this bill going through Parliament will will begin to have other communities thinking about that as well. I don't want to sound too negative, Cabinet Secretary, but um, I need to ask the question about in relation to um, community managers. Um, it may be the same answer too with every other um, manager taking on assets for the Crown, in, in relation to the Crown Estate, but what would happen if things went wrong? Well, we very much hope things um, do not go wrong. Um, I, I suppose it's in the nature of uh, things that uh, there will occasionally be hiccups. And uh, um, uh, uh, from our perspective, both the Crown Estate and us as ministers would need to be um, uh, uh, would need to be um, looking very closely at first of all defining wrongness. And I and I and I think that you know some of the earlier conversations we had about whether or not a community has taken on something that, that can make money or whether they're prepared to take it on on the off chance that it might make money, which is a, which is a slightly different category. What, what is the wrong thing in these circumstances? Um, uh, um, the absolute nuclear option is that we would take management back off them, but we would try, if possible, not to be in that position. But we, we have provided for that being... The, the nuclear option, right. if, if needs be. And, and at the end of the day, the, that bigger picture about um, uh, financial viability and the Scottish Consolidated Fund will, is, is, the, is the final red line, if you like, that we've got to keep in, keep in mind. John Scott. Uh, well, thank you, uh, convener. Um, returning, or moving now to the, the Crown Estate uh, Scotland staff, and. Uh, Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the committee carried out a confidential survey of all Crown Estate Scotland interim management staff seeking their views on the bill. In that survey, there was much, um, many fears expressed among the, the staff, the fear of fragmentation. A number of people believe that the bill will lead to their jobs being lost and other not very positive comments, it would have to be said. What reassurance can the Cabinet Secretary give to the current staff of Crown Estate Scotland? Um, always creates um, uncertainty um, and I don't expect the Crown State staff are excluded from that feeling. They're, they're every, you know, what they've known, the way they have worked is clearly uh, going to change. Um, but as we've already discussed, for the foreseeable future, uh, um, the staff who work for Crown Estate will have a uh, continuing role um, and I've actually taken the time and trouble to personally go and visit the staff on a number of occasions because I was very conscious um, that this whole policy change could take place without reference to them at all. Um, and we haven't done that. That's not how we have uh, proceeded. And I would very much hope as well that, um, you know, potential uh, new managers would also uh, think about that aspect, um, uh, that aspect too, as we have done. Um, but um, uh, uh, at, at, at present, 
Um, I, I think the uncertainty um, is of the nature that you, you would see whenever there is change uh, uh, coming, uh, regardless of what that change is. Um, and uh, um, I, I suspect that um, the continued retention for national management of um, a, a significant part of what Crown Estate does means that in actual fact that change will probably be far more minimal than perhaps at the outset um, uh, the, the, the staff might have feared. Um, uh, I think that whatever the concerns about the fragmentation of management were, um, uh, by the experience so far of those bodies prepared to and asking about a transfer of management, that the numbers are actually not as many as I would have anticipated. So it remains to be seen how attractive an option this is to some organisations and some local authorities. Um, uh, and I think we could be many years down the line uh, before the final verdict um, is, 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 is out on, on the devolution, the internal devolution of the Crown Estate. Good. I'm sure the staff will find that um, reassuring, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So you don't envisage any jobs being lost? I mean, is there a policy of no redundancies in place of other yeah, staff? Crown Estate to, to comply. They're not legally obliged to comply. They're one of the groups that can choose to. We would ask them to do that. Most of the bodies that aren't legally obliged to comply with that do comply with that, and we would... <coughs> We would look at that. I mean, there's, you know, there's obviously uh, uh, a, a future that I can't uh, foresee. Um, I think it's it's important to, to remember that that staff terms and conditions uh, would always need to be borne in mind. Contractual arrangements such as pension provisions, etc., still have to be absolutely uh, catered for. Um, so uh, um, I'm hoping that this change will have as little impact on the staff as it possibly could. I mean, it is a change in the way things are managed, but I think there has been reference already to some of the smaller community uh, uh, facilities, um, perhaps uh, a feeling there that things haven't been just, you know, quite as hands-on as they might otherwise have been, and that's the bit that we're hoping will be changed uh, um, by this internal devolution of management. Um, but I, I can't see that significantly impacting <coughs> on the staff in Edinburgh. I hear what you say, but, uh, and I'm sure they would seek to have their fears allayed, but notwithstanding, there will be, uh, it appears from what you've already said this morning, that there will be a preponderance of other experts invited to advise communities and, and the local authorities on on how to proceed and, and manage assets. And those who've hitherto done that within the Crown Estates, what will be their role? I mean, what will be their future role? How will their jobs change then, given that they will be no longer to require the assets that they were previously? I don't know a single organisation anywhere in the country that doesn't have to deal with change at some stage or another. Um, uh, and, and that applies to the Crown Estate as to anywhere else. There will, be a, there will perhaps be a change in the way they uh, do some of the management. They're still doing strategic plan. Um, uh, you know, there are likely to be uh, uh, very significant parts of the Crown Estate remain to be managed nationally. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I, I think at the moment and for the foreseeable future, I don't see an enormous amount of change for the staff. Um, now, that, you know, can I promise that there will be no change for any staff at any point in the future? No, of course I can't, but I couldn't have said that about any organisation uh, uh, either. So, uh, in that sense, the Crown Estate isn't in a different position to any of the other organisations uh, uh, within the general purview of this portfolio. Okay, uh, moving on, can I remind members we still have a lot of ground to cover? Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, parallel with the financial asset obligations that we've explored in considerable detail, um, I'd like to turn to the wider social economic development and environmental duties that are focused on in Section 7 and 9 in the Bill. And um, the cab you'll know, Cabinet Secretary, that, that um, the committee has not heard of any outright op opposition um, 
to the inclusion of the wider duties highlighted in those sections in the bill. Um, however, um, some stakeholders have called for them um, to become mandatory duties or for their effect to be strengthened. And the word um, must, which is in reflection, is, is in connection with the financial asset obligations in the bill um, have been argued for rather than may. So in, in your view, should the wider duties be mandatory? And if so, in what way could these be strengthened? Um, I, I think I gave a fairly um, a reasonable explanation why we have chosen to make the financial duty mandatory. I mean, I, I, you know, there's a pretty significant impact yes. um, uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, so it's pretty important that it, when we talk about maintaining the value of an asset and that being a mandatory duty, that we, um, uh, we however, communicate to managers that the way they fulfil that duty um, includes the promotion uh, um, uh, or improvement of the various other socioeconomic factors um, at seven. Um, and that's, from our perspective, a good reason, if we can use the may-must um, uh, terminology, um, that's, in, uh, in, in our view, a good reason uh, uh, for the may um, rather than the must. In many instances, um, those factors have to be borne in mind in order to maintain the must of the of the of of the value, um, uh, the duty in seven one is not a maximisation of value, but a duty to maintain value and improve where possible. So uh, I, d I, d I wouldn't want there to be a kind of false understanding there of it being, you know, a maximising of value at the expense of everything. That's clearly not what we have in mind, and that's very much borne out by. Um, by the language um, and, and I also think it's important to see this legislation within a broader context um, uh, and that's the, 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 the broader context of the principles of um, sustainable development. Um, the Crown Estate currently has been asked to, to, to look at the, th this extra um, uh, line and they are working it um, so far effectively. Uh, um, uh, and we, we think that that can go on being the case. Um, so at the moment, uh, we don't feel that we need to move everything to a must um, uh, in the way I think that some have, have, um, have suggested. Um, we, do, we don't see there being the conflict that, 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 that some people do. Um, for the reasons I've already said. So to maintain and improve the value, some of these other things will have to be um, uh, brought on board anyway. But surely if that's, that's the case, then the, the must, um, in, for instance, in, in relation to <coughs> environmental duties, um, uh, should be um, considered as, as the Crown Estate is public. Um, Any also. environmental duties that are imposed by statute, well, they will have to comply with anyway. Um, that, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, uh, exempted from, from, uh, uh, from any of those uh, formal duties. Um, uh, but I think that one of the issues that we'd also perhaps need to be taken into consideration is that um, those factors might not be relevant in if absolutely everything a manager does. So if you say must, and then they have to take something into consideration that actually is not a relevant factor in a particular decision, then, then that, that becomes a, 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 an exercise of, of futility. Um, uh, and I don't really um, see that that would be particularly, um, particularly helpful uh, um, for, for trying to get managers to... to, to to, to make the decisions that they need to make. I mean, I, I, I think in truth, the, 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 the reason why communities will want to take on the management of these assets will be to maximize across a whole range of benefits. Um, uh, the you know, traditional criticism has been that, that, that that's not been the case, that's not perhaps been what's happening. Now, whether that was a fair criticism or not, we're not really in a position to judge, but 
the reason why communities will want to take on management of this is precisely in order to maximise benefits across a range. So I, I, I don't see the things as in conflict. Okay. Uh, Mark Roscoe. And very briefly to um, the points that you made in your opening statement, Cabinet Secretary, about dispersing net revenues to communities. Um, I just wonder if there's anything more you'd like to add in terms of the process uh, and the mechanism um, behind that. I mean, would it be the intention, for example, that some of the, uh, the financial benefits to communities would be put through participatory budgeting, or could it go through council budgets, or... Are there any restrictions or thoughts on how this should or shouldn't be done at this point? Um, well, uh, the, the, uh, the, I think the point I made in my, uh, in, in my previous remarks on this is that um, however the distribution is made, whatever the, the calculation and the formula for that distribution is, the, 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 the money will not be hypothecated um, because that's the nature of the settlement that we have with local government. Um, the amounts of money involved, however, will be known. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I would have anticipated uh, that any managers, and I suppose in this particular sense, we're talking mostly about the local authorities, um, will, will themselves want to account for how they're using that money. Now, how they choose to do that is a matter for them. Um, I, we're not, at the moment, uh, uh, thinking about mandating some mechanism by which a local authority would then make its decisions thereafter about what it considered to be the best way to spend that money. But what we would do is expect to see it spent for the betterment of coastal communities, um, however that might be uh, defined. But I, I, I don't think it would be the proper place for us, given the nature of the local government settlement, to send that money to local authorities and try and attach a set of strings to it. Um, uh, to do that would require a change in the way the relationship between government and, and local authorities works at the moment. The amounts of money that are sent to local government, however, will be known. Um, and I would hope and expect that people will hold their local authorities to account on that. Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. And turning now to the 9% the figure, and thank you for the revenue chart too, which you've helpfully provided us with. It's a simple question, essentially, um, and it is essentially around the 9% figure, and should Crown Estate managers of assets be able to retain and invest more than 9% of, of the revenue they earn? How do you see that? story unfolding because you in the bill you've said that you expect to introduce a flexibility into that nine percent figure yeah, that's the flat rate that uh, uh, that comes effectively with the devolution and it is the flat rate that is being applied by the uk government um in respect of the crown estate um uh over the uk as a whole and what will be the residual england and wales uh, crown estate so um, our view was that, uh, that, that you know, we will start off with 9% simply because that's where we are, but that what we wanted to try and do was keep that situation under review uh, and consider whether 9% actually does simply apply across the board or whether there might be occasions when you allowed managers uh, in some areas or depending on the asset to retain more, there might be more management uh, um, uh, uh, required for some assets than for others but equally that then means the likelihood is that others may get to retain less so it's not just about retaining more it's also about perhaps there are some where the actual management function isn't as great and therefore the retention might be less so all we're doing is trying to retain that flexibility not to be tied to an across-the-board 9% figure, which may not apply uh, in, in every case. Um, but that will be, um, uh, that will enable us to respond to the different kinds of, of management that there are. I mean, you know, to go back to what some of the conversations we had earlier, if a, if a community group is, is wanting to step up because they, they see an asset and they, you know, they, they say to themselves, well, that is simply not, 
generating what it could for the community. We think we can do better and we want to set out a plan that does that. We may then take the view that in those circumstances, they get to retain a greater percentage because they are going to be putting more effort into that management than perhaps a different group who are, are just wanting something to take over. I, it, it really is just to allow us that flexibility. I, but there are no immediate plans. I have nothing in mind at the moment <laughs> um, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we're thinking about. It's just that that's the figure we inherit, and we think it's a bit of a... It, it's, it's a very big kind of axe to take to what might actually be something that can be dealt with more flexibly. No, I appreciate the need for flexibility. It will depend on, on good years. It will depend on income that you have available to you, uh, whether or not you can uh, allow the, the, the need to return money to the Scottish Consolidated Fund and the, and the potential to yeah. give uh, the Scottish Crown Estates um, more to invest. So I, I perfectly well understand that. Um, however, the, my second question is, if the Scottish Crown Estates become fragmented and if a higher proportion of asset managers are able to retain a higher proportion of their revenues, that's not the Crown Estate managers, what impact will that have on the ability of the Crown Estate Scotland to invest in the farms in the rural estate, for example? That's why we're keeping the cross-subsidy. Um, that's, you know, that is a, a very specific example of, of, uh, of why we want to retain that cross-subsidy. Um, and as unpopular as it might make a minister to step in uh, and say to one set of managers, so you're going to have to transfer money uh, over to another set of managers, that is nevertheless uh, how we wish to, to be able to proceed. Because otherwise, um, the, the, that estate as a whole uh, would begin to be in difficulty. And, and the cross-subsidy uh, part of this has, has been... I think well understood. You know, there's been a, a very active um, uh, uh, stakeholder advisory group all the way along this process, and we've never hidden that part of the conversation from them. Um, so I, I think that people are well aware that that is uh, a possibility. Thank you. Bearing in mind you've, you've, we've already discussed the, the cross subsidies, uh, how will the potential impact on other assets be taken into account when you're actually making the initial decision to transfer or delegate management of assets? Sorry, can you... If, if you've got to make a decision on transferring assets, what uh, part will... the? Do you mean if I have to make a decision about a community taking on responsibility for management? Absolutely, yes. Right, OK. Because so, I was using transfer in a different sense. Sorry. But if we're, if we're looking at uh, how we can support the non-profit-making parts of the, uh -huh. the state, the cross-subsidising uh, will be one. But what uh, will you uh, assess the potential financial impacts prior to transferring or not transferring to uh, the, the management or asset? Well, every single one of the applications for uh, um, taking um, control of management of an asset will have to be looked at very carefully in terms of its merits. There will be a lot of factors to be considered. Um, that may be one that we would, uh, that we would look at. Um, uh, and it goes back to the conversation I, that I had with John Scott. That it may be that some, uh, uh, some organizations, whether they be community or, or not, feel that they can make a far better fist of running it than has been the case, in which case they can turn an asset into one which is actually not needing transfers of money in, but might be in a happier position in a few years' time. So it, that would be a conversation that we would need to have with them at the time of the application, because we would be expecting when people came forward to consider taking on the management, that they would have a, a, a clear plan and, and proposals that they were looking at. We're not, you know, it isn't simply, you know, sign a brief form and then you get the management transferred. It's too important for that. So, so there will be, uh, 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 you know, that will be part of the, the conversation. And, and if it is an asset that they don't realise is, 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 is not actually individually making money, then they will be made aware of that as part of 
of that application. Um, and uh, I'm just being reminded that managers or prospective managers are going to have to show three-year plans. So, you know, when we're talking to people about taking over management, they've got to be thinking about it not just on day one or even six months down the line, but they've got to think about it over that period. So all of that will be part and parcel of the conversation that we have. And I anticipate, as sometimes will happen, that sometimes maybe a group will come forward and then decide, oh, well, do you know what? That's not really what we thought. Uh, we, we thought there was more in this or we thought there was something or whatever. I'm also hoping that what we get is communities that come forward and say, look, we want to do this because we think it could be better run and here's why we think it could be better run and here's our plan for it being better run. And that's a conversation I hope I'm having or, or the Crown Estate's having with more people rather than fewer people. And that will turn assets into generating income generating assets rather than than those that are not. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply to some of the, 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 the bigger ones, um, uh, but who knows in the future that it might. So is, is there any uh, thought given at the moment that there may be some parts of the Crown Estate that you don't want or you would, you would choose not to um, allow communities to take over because they're key to the overall performance of the Crown Estate and its ability to support the state, the parts of the state that are not quite so viable. We haven't looked at it in quite those terms. We've been thinking more about national strategic priorities. We've been looking at the, you know, the pressure from the, the tenant farmers within the four uh, uh, um, uh, tenanted estates. Um, it hasn't been so much from a perspective of uh, uh, what asset is, is income generating and what is not. It's been more about a, a slightly bigger picture um, about what is a more appropriate way to look at it. And, you know, the, the, when you think about the big telecoms, the big renewables and all the rest of it, that, that's perhaps understandable that, that that doesn't get chopped up, shouldn't that, that it'd be harder to see how that would work chopped up. But they, of course, are also some of the really big income generating um, sectors too. Um, uh, and we, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that you know, while we might want to focus on some smaller assets that aren't such big income generators, there are some big in income generators there too. Um, and, and, but, and that's why it was important to keep the cross-subsidy idea, because there are some big income generators. So that cross-subsidy idea um, is, is important. Um, and there will also be a strategic management plan for a national perspective on this too. So, you know, we're not losing sight of the bigger picture with the very, uh, you know, with the very individual conversations that may, uh, that may be getting had in this. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I, I don't at this stage have uh, a clear idea whether or not the Crown Estate could point to each individual asset and say with certainty that that is or is not um, income generating. Um, uh, that's something that will probably emerge over the next uh, year or two. Um, and uh, um, I, I will make a shrewd guess and suspect that they, that will tend to be the much smaller assets, more localised, rather than the bigger strategic ones. But that's, that's a bit of a guess at this stage. Moving on, Angus MacDonald. Thanks, Convener. If we could touch on the Coastal Communities Fund, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we, we know it's been historically tied at a UK level to revenues generated by the Crown Estate and it's delivered by the Big Lottery Fund. Uh, and I'm glad to say, Convener, that uh, even in my constituency in the industrial heartland of central Scotland, we've managed to tap into uh, the Coastal Communities Fund for some of my groups. Um, but can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what... Um, what the plans are for the fund from now on? Um, well, the short answer is that we are indeed considering what the best way forward is for that. Um, the, the member is correct. It's a scheme we've inherited from the United Kingdom government along with the various financial pressures created by the fiscal framework and the reduction in the Scottish block grant. It is linked to the Crown Estate uh, 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 um, as well. It's currently competitive. There's no guarantee of success. Um, there are a lot of coastal parts of Scotland that have never received any uh, CCF funding. 
um, and it has traditionally been administered uh, by the big lottery fund. Um, so we are looking at it in the context of the changes that are being made uh, in terms of the Crown Estate. Um, I'm obviously going to be absolutely committed to supporting the current projects through to complete, uh, completion, but no final decision has been made about the Coastal Communities Fund uh, because of its link to the, to the, the, the formula from the, the Crown Estate funding. So uh, because we're now at a national level in a different set of funding circumstances um, and coastal communities will now be receiving mon monies directly disbursed from the Crown Estate, we need to look at whether or not the Coastal Communities Fund is now, in Scotland at least, uh, 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 a, a fund that, uh, um, uh, that, that is going to get continued in, in the current circumstances, but no final decisions have been made yet. We need to work through a number of things. But I just need to remind people that the commitment to all coastal local authorities getting uh, money will mean a number of coastal local authorities getting money in an area where there's never been any coastal community fund money given to them uh, or, or to their communities. So we're in a different set of financial circumstances now. Okay, and, and there is, of course, a suggestion that there will be a revised uh, funding formula uh, of, well, from 50% of the revenues from, <coughs> from marine activities down to 33%, um, as far as I understand it, from the UK government. Treasury. Yeah, UK, UK government. System. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure whether any of the officials know more about that or what impact, if any, that would have on us, I don't think. Is that the Coastal Communities? That's about the Coastal Communities Fund. That's yes. correct, yes. I, if I could um, um, uh, say that, um, uh, that that's our understanding that the Treasury recently uh, reduced the, 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 the amount of money that was made available by them under the Coastal Communities Fund from an equivalent of 50% of uh, Crown Estate uh, marine income to 33%, and uh, the Fiscal Framework Agreement uh, on the devolution of the Coastal Communities Fund was based upon the expenditure uh, in the year prior to the, the transfer. So that should all have worked through the system. OK, thank you. Um, during our uh, consultation, we received a submission from the Grangemouth Yacht Club uh, in, in my constituency, um, <laughs> who also uh, well, they stated that uh, the only contact they have with the Crown Estate uh, or Crown Estate Scotland is to pay an annual bill of £640. Um, so, uh, as a matter of principle, would you say that um, the Crown Estate uh, Scotland and other asset managers have to provide a service in relation to what they charge uh, their, their tenants? And is there scope for smaller community organisations, such as Grangemouth Yacht Club, to be exempt from such charges? Um, well, um, the, 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 the rent of the property is the service. I mean, I... I you know they are <laughs> they're paying rent for something they're not paying rent for nothing so um that uh, uh um uh that uh um is a kind of very short answer um they i think they've got the exclusive use of the mooring so that's that's what their rent is for um in terms of uh, uh, the, the wider uh, position about smaller to community organisations being exempt, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you have to bear in mind the duty in Section 7 to maintain and seek to enhance the value uh, of the estate and the income arising from it. Um, and managers are empowered to do what is considered appropriate to that. So there won't be any blanket exemptions. I think that would be very much a matter locally um, for managers. Now, uh, you know, managers, a, a different set of managers uh, may uh, decide to do that uh, if they felt there was a bigger um, picture that they wanted to pursue. Um, I would be sceptical as to whether that was likely in the shorter term, um, uh, frankly. Um, given the duties on managers. OK, thanks, Camille. You certainly can't blame them for trying. No, uh... <laughs> 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 uh, Moving on, Donald Cameron. But whether or not they're successful is a matter. Donald Cameron. 
I refer to my register of interest as a landowner in the Highlands. Um, I've got two questions. Um, the first is um, about cr cross subsidy, which um, we've discussed a lot <coughs> already. But in terms of giving the Crown, Crown of State Scotland financial flexibility, um, and you'll forgive my ignorance, but is the Crown of State currently able to, for example, borrow or enter joint ventures or, 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 or other um, aspects which will give that financial flexibility to it? And do, do, does the bill change that? David? Yes, um, if I could um, attempt to answer that. Um, at present, um, there's the, the ability for Scottish ministers to give loans to um, Crown Estate Scotland, um, and that facility is, uh, is extended and, uh, for inclusion in the bill uh, to apply to other managers. Um, the Crown Estate um, Act did have a limited number of situations where um, the, uh, the, 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 the manager could um, enter into borrowing, but there were a very narrow set of circumstances, and that was viewed by um, uh, Crown Estate Scotland in its nascent form as, um, as, a, as a constraint on uh, viability. So Scottish ministers decided to extend the facility to, to provide loans. But beyond that, um, there isn't the intention for there to be um, you know, wider uh, loans uh, taken out because of the risk that could uh, pose to the, the monarch's ultimate ownership um, of the estate. When it comes to joint ventures, um, the, the bill was specifically designed not to preclude joint ventures being entered into. Um, that is something that we continue to um, have discussion with uh, Crown Estate Scotland about on an operational basis to see whether there is in fact a need for that or not. Okay, that's very helpful indeed. Um, could I just uh, then move on to um, delegation and transfer of management responsibilities? I, I think it's right that sections three, four and five set out the processes for, the, for transfer and delegation. Um, and my question is, um, is uh, the panel satisfied that those processes uh, are effective in terms of being firstly transparent uh, and allowing proper parliamentary scrutiny? Secondly, that they give asset managers um, clear lines of accountability that they can work to? And thirdly, that there is an effective process of dispute resolution? Um, yes, in broad terms, I do think that the bill provisions are uh, appropriate um, and uh, allow for uh, what is being raised. Um, I, I, in terms of parliamentary scrutiny, the, there will be SSIs. Uh, transfers uh, uh, will be made by SSIs, so that in itself will be uh, subject to parliamentary scrutiny um, and the terms and conditions of the transfer will be set out in the SSI. So uh, the, the, the detail of, of, of some of that then will be available. Um, uh, similar provisions will be made in respect of delegation, um, although when it comes to delegation, that won't be subject to a parliamentary procedure um, because effectively uh, the Crown Estate Scotland will retain aspects of management which have not been delegated to another manager. And the, 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 you know, our, our position at the moment is that that section of the bill, that part of the bill, um, does exactly uh, um, what, it, what it should do. Um, uh, uh, I'm also kind of just having flagged up to me that there'll be annual reporting um, uh, and the dispute resolution will be part of the SSI um, or delegation agreement. That, that will be built into the, to what you see up front when, when, the transfer, uh, uh, when the transfer of management is made. Thanks. Um, do you see a potential conflict of interest with local authorities given their function as a planning authority uh, in relation to aquaculture uh, and the fact that obviously they would be uh, net receivers of, of revenues um, under, under this bill? Uh, and also, do, do you see a similar conflict of interest in relation to harbour authorities, which arguably have uh, you know, less stringent, democratically accountable governance processes compared to councils in some cases? Well, I, I think our yeah. view pretty much is that councils um, already have to make a huge range of decisions um, uh, across a whole number of areas where 
objectively, you could argue that they have a conflict of interest. I mean, you know, when it comes to building a school, it's their own planning authority that has to make the decision about planning. So, you know, handling conflict of interest is already part and parcel um, of what uh, uh, local authorities have to do. And, you know, to my knowledge, they already have pretty rigorous governance arrangements uh, to manage that uh, uh, way of, of taking things uh, forward. Um, and that I don't see why it would be any different in respect uh, of this. Um, I don't think, uh, I cannot imagine that any council is going to intentionally try to uh, mismanage. And I, I, you know, I don't want to be drawn down the road of specifically talking about aquaculture because actually this could apply to almost anything, uh, um, really. Um, uh, I, I think um, they will be trying to ensure, um, uh, 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 you know, that their management is as well done as the management of almost any aspect of uh, uh, of their uh, of the rest of their duties. Um, so I think councils particularly are um, very well versed in managing that. A harbour authority, uh, if a harbour authority um, does become a, a manager, then it's going to have to comply with uh, the duties that are legislated for, um, for example, in areas like reporting. Um, so they will have to uh, bring themselves into compliance uh, uh, with that. Um, so I, I think this is, this is um, manageable because it's a thing that has had to be managed for, for decades. That, you know, um, we have single local authorities who, who do this on a regular basis and I don't imagine that the management of Crown Estate assets is going to be managed any differently to that. Would, would you see a tension, though, in particular in relation to harbour authorities, uh, if you look at the issue of ship-to-ship -ship oil transfers, where there's a commercial uh, incentive to develop ship-to-ship, -ship, but there's also a regulatory function that the harbour authority has to, uh, has to discharge? Well, I, I mean, they will have to comply with what, all the statutes. Any manager that takes on um, the management of an asset, regardless of what it is, um, will have to comply with all the statutory uh, requirements that are out there that relate to that particular area of endeavour. I mean, I, I, I'm perhaps misunderstanding what you're trying to what you're trying to raise here, because all of that will be part and parcel of the management. They're not because they're man I mean, the Crown Estate has to abide by this as it is. So we're not actually bringing anything new in by, by asking, you know, devolved managers to also comply uh, um, with any legislative authorities. Um, uh, and I'm just having paragraph six, 18 pointed out. Um, yeah, uh, the exercise of functions have got to be transparent and accountable. So any harbour authority or anybody else who Makes a decision for makes a decision for whatever reason has to be very clear about why it's doing that, mm -hmm. but it will also have to comply with the whole range of other statutory obligations that 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 you know that are required for any area of endeavour. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just referring to the uh, functions uh, that harbour authorities have their own regulatory functions and the potential conflict there. Well, I. I, I I mean, I, what potential conflict would you... I mean, I, I don't know what specific conflict you really have in mind. Um, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't understand. I mean, if a harbour authority wants to take over the management of the harbour, um, then they've got to manage it in a way that delivers all of the objectives that, that, we, that we have set out. Um, and they're not, they, you know... They will do that. Um, uh, assessment under the Habitats Directive, for example. Well, the, but they're not excluded from that. But no. this, that still has to, that will still be in place. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, none of that flies off because they've become a manager of, of a Crown Estate property. Could I perhaps add something on the, 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 the original question? Um, 
as I understand it, the Harbour Authority already has functions in relation to ship-to-ship -ship oil transfer, um, and the, uh, the, the Crown Estates functions relate to the seabed ownership, um, primarily about um, maintenance dredging and other forms of dredging for navigational purposes and uh, the dumping of spoil that has uh, been kind of collected through the, the dredge. So the, 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 func the, the bill's um, provisions are about you know, the, the control of those latter activities. Uh, and as the Cabinet Secretary has said, those would still have to be um, undertaken by any manager in the context of wider regulations that exist. Thank you. And turning now uh, to section six of the bill, the Law Society have expressed concerns in relation to the drafting of section six and have stated that we, we do not consider that the meaning of relates to a community where it appears in section 61A is clear. So what is the definition of relates to a community in section 61A? And further, uh, when I'm speaking, I suppose, um, the requirements set out in section 6.2 do not appear to be inclusive, particularly those at section 6.2c and 6.2d. And the Law Society consider that there would be merit in amending the requirements for a community organisation to fall within the terms of the bill. So does the Scottish Government agree with the Law Society that section 6.2c and 6.2d could be amended to be more inclusive? Um, right, OK. Um, the provisions in Section 6 uh, in terms of community organisation are similar to the ones that are already in the Community Empowerment Act. Um, so, in my view, that means they are sufficiently inclusive. Um, uh, obviously, we have to recognise that evidence of community control is important, but... Uh, um, uh, uh, in my view, the fact that they've effectively the, the definition has been imported from existing legislation um, uh, uh, means, and I, I'm not sure whether the Law Society were aware of that or not, but that's, that's where that definition has come from. So we consider it is, in fact, sufficiently inclusive. And further, uh, section section six two f in the law society view refers to promotion of a benefit for that community. We note that the concept of public benefit is already recognised in law. For example, in section eight of the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act two thousand and five, it would be helpful in the law society's view if there was some consistency between these statutes, between particularly when section seventeen of the bill refers to the public benefit provisions under the 2005 Act. So on one hand, you have promotion of a benefit for that community. On another hand, you have public benefit. Um, so should there be more consistency around the terminology of public benefits as the Law Society suggests? Well, again, um, we've taken the definitions from, uh, uh, I, I think, um, uh, from the Community Empowerment Act, they exactly replicate the, the, the definitions in the Community Empowerment Act. Um, so, uh, again, in our view, that, from our perspective, seems to provide um, sufficient consistency. Um, ag again, I, I haven't seen the specific Law Society evidence that you're talking about, that, you know, whether or not they were uh, conscious of that. I mean, we're, we're using what is... I mean, I, I can't think of any better example of consistency than to, than to use these definitions across other legislation. You would reflect on, perhaps, but uh, thank you for the answers. OK, I have a final question on this uh, from Finlay Carson. Okay. Some of the evidence that we've heard in committee has uh, argued for the strengthening of protection uh, against the sale of the seabed... Uh, can the bill be strengthened uh, to prohibit sales of uh, the seabed uh, uh, and should it? And, and do you agree with COSLA, for example, that there are circumstances under which the seabed might be sold? Uh, we're not convinced by the COSLA um, position. Um, uh, it is this, this government's view that the presumption against selling the seabed should be maintained. Um, and... Uh, um, it's 
you know, we, we've talked a lot about cross-subsidy, so that the fact that, you know, a, a, a bit of seabed is a loss-making asset isn't a reason to sell because there is the capacity to uh, cross-subsidise. Um, uh, so uh, by maintaining the element of cross-subsidy, um, uh, we think that the uh, presumption against selling the seabed uh, should should stay. Um, uh, I mean, it's 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 a debate. Uh, I I no doubt expect um, may continue. But from our perspective at this stage, we're not convinced that the COSLA approach is correct. Okay. Cabinet Secretary and your officials, thank you for that. That's been a long morning, but we've covered a lot of ground. At the next meeting of the committee on the 1st of May, it will consider subordinate legislation relating to the Loch Caron Marine Conservation Order, which the committee considered last year. The committee will also consider draft correspondence on the National Performance Framework and its approach to the gender diversity of witness panels. It will also review its work programme. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session, and I request that the public gallery eh, be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed just as my phone goes off.